Tales of Symphonia is the game ever made. That's about all I can say objectively because it's been a hot minute since I played it on the Nintendo GameCube back in 1986 or whenever it was. Yeah, having recently produced an award-winning video on a JRPG I didn't grow up with. Here's the thing, you motherfucker should have voted for somebody because Madular won three years in a row. I decided to revisit one that I do have some history with. In terms of how many JRPGs ended up on the system, the GameCube was a big step up from the N64 with cult classics such as Baton Katos, Skies of Arcadia, 18-wheeler American Pro Trucker, and of course, Tales of Symphonia. When this game hit Western shelves back in 2004, I and many others hadn't heard of the Tales of series to which it belongs. Don't get me wrong, some dedicated weeaboos caught wind of Tales of Destiny and Tales of Eternia, the only two that had dropped on Western shores up to that point, but the momentum this series experienced was largely limited to glorious Nippon. That all changed with Tales of Symphonia, which would be many gaijin's first chance to get our greasy McChicken sauce covered hands on a Tales game, myself included. I loved the game, I played through it many times and it made a big impression on me. Apparently, many fellow connoisseurs agreed because the game reviewed very well and sold far beyond Namco's expectations, giving the Tales series a foothold in the West as high-quality action RPGs. For some reason or another, I drifted away from Symphonia. It's been many years since I last played the game, during which time there's been nearly a dozen Tales games iterating on the standards set by Symphonia. Having recently played and reviewed a few other JRPGs, my mind keeps coming back to the world of Symphonia. Was it the incredible experience I remember it as, or are my memories rose-tinted by Symphonia being my first contact with the series? Well, I've accrued about 15 years worth of cynicism and an aversion to stupid-ass JRPG tropes. Courage is the magic that turns dreams into reality. Ugh. The question is, can Tales of Symphonia overcome these hurdles and justify the pedestal it stands atop in my mind? There's only one way to find out. Watch a two-hour video of it on YouTube. Oh shit, I have to make it? Now before talking about the game proper, let's talk about some of the technical differences between releases. I originally played the game on GameCube, but the game also saw a port to PlayStation 2 in Japan. In 2013, this PS2 version was ported to the PlayStation 3, along with the game's Wii-exclusive sequel in Tales of Symphonia Chronicles. This version, which came with some additional content and optional Japanese voice acting, was the basis for the PC version released on Steam in 2016, which is the version that I'm playing. Improvements over the original GameCube release included better animations, new abilities, new side quests, and many other little touches, but if you ask me, GameCube is still the definitive version. Why? Because A, this dungeon has a little rotating GameCube in it, which is adorable, and B, because the GameCube version is the only one that runs at 60 FPS. That's right, every subsequent subsequent release of this game runs at 30 FPS, including the PC version. There are mods that implement some fixes, but as far as I understand, the PS2 version, which all subsequent releases were based on, has its animations tied to the lower frame rate, so there's effectively no way of unlocking the FPS without breaking the game. Now, this isn't world-shatteringly awful to me, but given that the game's combat system is action-based and reflexes do matter, it feels noticeably stiffer compared to the GameCube release. I hadn't played the game in many a year, but muscle memory kicked in and I felt like something was wrong throughout the entire experience. The other thing to mention is... Alright, I'm just gonna come out and say it. I'm playing the game in English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm sorry, okay? I get it. I know you- Look, please, calm down. Please be quiet. Just shut up. Shut up! I think some purists may say it's better to use the original Japanese audio, but I decided to go with the dub for a few different reasons. First of all, it's a high-quality localization, largely. Though the recording quality of the voice acting tends to vary a bit, there are a lot of extremely talented voice actors who suit their role really damn well. And having grown up playing this version, I consider some of the voices to be iconic. I mean, you've got Scott Menville, Crispin Freeman, Tara Strong, and James Arnold Taylor. Suzanne plans no, not James Taylor. James Arnold Taylor, just to name a few. It's a stacked cast, and while not every single one of them hits the mark, they're largely giving excellent performances, so it'd be a shame to disregard it out of a preconceived notion that English dubs are inherently inferior. That brings me to the second reason I have for choosing the dub here, which is that as a native English speaker with no grasp on the Japanese language, my ability to judge performances would be limited. When speaking, there are nuances and inflections which can change the listener understanding of a statement.
statement. Knowing a language is critical to picking up on these subtle cues. Now don't misinterpret what I'm saying here. There are times where I'll choose the original Japanese audio and I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. If your goal isn't to critique like mine is, not being able to nitpick the individual components of someone's speech isn't really a problem. And it's true that oftentimes the original Japanese performances are obviously superior to the localized audio, even if you can't understand what they're saying. I am free. Goodbye violence. Goodbye tyranny. I thank you for summoning me. You may receive my compliments. I just wanted to have this preamble in here so people can understand why I made the choice that I did. There was a legitimate effort to bring the English voice acting up to par, and as a result, it's the intended way for the Western audience to experience the game. So that's what I'll be judging. Without further ado, let's get into the game. The game begins with a short sequence in which Liquid Snake explains some lore. Once upon a time, there existed a giant ocelot that was the source of detonation codes. The long and short of this story is that once upon a time, a great tree filled the world with mana. The mana gave rise to what's known as Magi technology, the central cause of a very long and bloody war, which itself drained the mana, causing the tree to die. Eventually, the war was ended by a now legendary hero named Mythos, who sacrificed himself in order to save the tree. A goddess named Martel fell into a sadness-induced sleep, I feel that, and told her angels, you must wake me, for if I should sleep, the world shall be destroyed. That's the background for the game, at least the beginning. Now, you might have some questions about that, but for now, just try to see it as a creation myth. Enjoy it for what it is, because I promise I will stumble over myself with unkempt hair and a loosened tie explaining to you the intricacies of the story later on. So, as a result of all that, a chosen one must periodically make a dangerous journey around the world, unlocking a series of seals and ultimately becoming an angel, which wakes Martel, so to speak and buys the world a bit more time. It's an interesting idea for a chosen one. Usually in stories where someone is born with the mark of the gods or something, there's a finality in what they're doing. Yeah, you're putting yourself through hell and battling against impossible odds, but the world will be saved in the end. In Symphonia, the best the chosen can hope for is staving off the inevitable for a bit longer. Factor in that the chosen's success isn't a guarantee. In fact, there have been more failed chosen than success stories at that point, and it adds a layer of doom and gloom, a kind of future. Utility. We are introduced to four of our leading characters at this point, who I'll briefly introduce for you. So you got the protagonist, Lloyd. Uh, I mentioned in the Legend of Dragoon video, just to reiterate, Lloyd is not a cool hero name. Which works, because Lloyd is not a cool hero. He's a rash, hot-headed teenager with a short attention span and a notable disinterest in learning from his mistakes. He is endearing, though. He doesn't care to learn what other people have to teach him, but when it comes to matters of his interest, he unlocks a hidden layer of intelligence, something I think a lot of RPG fans can relate to. He's also perfectly voice acted by Scott Menville, who does such a fantastic job bringing this emotional energy and borderline foolish optimism to Lloyd. I won't repeat this same mistake again. I'll destroy them all. The entire ranch! Lloyd, that's insanity. We also have Genus, Lloyd's best friend. The only elf in the village, other than his sister Rain. By the way, I was recording this at the same time as all the other things. I didn't just remember that Rain was also an elf and add this in afterwards. Genus is a genius, surpassing Lloyd's intelligence by a country mile, but matching him in childishness. Counter to Lloyd's unfettered positivity, Genus is a bit more neurotic and prone to pessimism. What rolls off Lloyd's back, Genus carries with him, which makes them a good team. Genus' depth of knowledge keeps Lloyd's emotion-driven plans in check, while Lloyd's hopeful outlook is therapeutic for Genus' permanent anxiety. Then there's Rain, Genus' older sister and the only teacher in their home village of Hesalia. Rain is intelligent, calculating, and far less prone to wearing her emotion on her sleeve than the boys, until there's some matter of academic importance. Then she starts spanking ass and taking names. Though she's Genus' sister, it's obvious that she's just as much a mother to him. Having been abandoned by their parents and being being the only two elves in the village, Rain is highly protective over her brother. Finally, there's Colette. She's bright, cheerful, and just as driven by optimism as Lloyd, but without all the hot-tempered baggage. She's clumsy and a little naive, but selfless to a fault. She puts herself through hell for other people, and as the current chosen one, it's her duty to do just that. Those are the current four main characters. As the story goes on, their personalities evolve and their quirks begin to make more sense, so we'll revisit them throughout the video. But this should be enough to give you an idea of who 
they are. A class being taught by Rain is interrupted by a brilliant light, which is referred to as the Oracle, which means that it's time for the Chosen One's journey to formally begin. As Rain heads to Azalea's temple to see what's going on, we take control of Lloyd, never one to let an opportunity go to what the fuck is that? Never one to let an opportunity go to waste, Lloyd convinces Genus and Colette to cut class so they can see what's going on. Movement throughout the game's towns and dungeons is about what you'd expect, though it's floatier than I remember. It might be a result of the frame rate, but it doesn't have the tightness I've come to expect from later Tales entries. You fly about 30 feet when you tap the joystick, which can be an issue when you're doing something that requires precision, like identifying uncles in the desert. But overall, it's not too bad. There's no jumping or anything like that, so interaction with the world is a little limited, but the game finds ways to make areas kind of interesting. More on that later. With monsters invading the village, this is also our first opportunity to try out the combat. Tails combat is the definition of easy to pick up, difficult to master. Getting into a fight sends you to a separate battle screen where a real-time action-based battle takes place. You can move bi-directionally towards or away from the enemies and swap planes of movement by changing your target. Later installments of the series would allow you to move freely throughout the battlefield and it's definitely something I'm missing a little bit here. As for fighting, using the attack button while tilting the control stick in different directions will initiate a few different combos, which can be mixed and matched. Enemies can guard attacks and so can you with the right timing, and in both cases, guard can be broken with persistence or by sneaking up behind the target. You can chain standard attacks with Tex, that is T E C H S, not T E X. As great as it would be to have Clint Eastwood show up with a repeater halfway through the fight. Get three coffins ready. Tex are Symphonia's version of character abilities. Just for some examples, Lloyd's Tex are all melee based, used to link attacks together and increase the combo counter. Genus uses magic spells, which take time to prepare but dish out reasonably high damage, especially if the element of the spell is an enemy's weakness. Rain uses status buffs and healing spells, and Colette sort of serves the role as the bard, a utility character that can help party members, hinder enemies, and use all sorts of helpful abilities. When the battle concludes, you're given a grade score based on your performance. Grade has a variety of uses I'll mention later, but suffice to say it incentivizes you to rack up your combo score and otherwise not play like a jackass. In the beginning, the fight system is pretty limited. You have a very small roster of abilities to use and it can be frustrating to swing your sword forever, unable to break an enemy's defense. However, like many aspects of this game, the battle system eventually unfolds into something deeper than it initially appears, but it takes a while to learn some of the more useful abilities. It's also worth mentioning that you can play as any character on your team. They all have their own unique but viable playstyle and it can be fun to switch things up to see how other characters play. You can even connect a second controller and have a partner jump in for some co-op battles. It may be personal preference, but I find Lloyd to be the most fun to play by far. While many characters rely on spells with long casting times or slow moving attacks, Lloyd's playstyle is quick and dynamic. He's got a huge variety of abilities that can be used on the fly, such as Tempest, which sends him flying through the air, slashing an enemy while landing behind them, or Beast, which unleashes a lion's spirit to knock enemies onto the ground. With Lloyd, you're acting quickly and in response to an enemy's movements, which gives it a bit more of a fighting game flavor, but I can see how more tactically minded players might enjoy some of the other characters as well. Some other nuances worth mentioning are that there's a short time limit in between item uses, which is totally fair. Otherwise, you could just spam healing items, which isn't appropriate for an action game. You can order other characters to use certain abilities on a whim or prevent them from using less useful skills, both extremely helpful. Why are you using Fireball? You've got Super Mega Giga Fireball Extreme Edition, Gene. Also, when you knock an enemy down, there's a brief period of near invulnerability for them. I understand why this is necessary, otherwise knockdown moves would just be way too strong, but it feels endlessly unsatisfying to knock an enemy down, and then all of a sudden, Genus decides to do something other than fireball, but it doesn't end up doing any damage. That's kind of a brief summary of the battle system. I'm of the mind that you can't really accurately know what an action-based battle system is like through description alone. It's something you intuitively pick up on while you play, but I hope you kind of get the gist. It's a good battle system. There are a lot of improvements made in later series games, but I can't fault Symphonia because it did a really good job of translating the Tails battle system to 3D, so much so that it was the basis of the series combat for almost decades now. The fighting is never boring. There's always a new tech waiting to be uncovered or a super boss to train for, and I'm playing on normal. There's also a hard and mania difficulty. Even hard threw me for a loop. You have to start thinking really critically about which party member is doing what. It almost kind of reminds me of Baldur's Gate, having to pause to strategize. If you beat the 
the game on Mania. Hey, kudos, man. Couldn't be me, but I respect the grind. So where was I? Oh yeah, so Yuri and Flynn are at odds over how to deal with the Don Whitehorse situation. Oh, hold on. Wrong game. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So if you got into this point, you can either choose Hanukkah or Lilith. No, that's not it either. Oh, here we go. Tales of Symphonia. Right. I don't know how that happened. The group heads to the temple to find it under attack by Desions. Now, what are Desions, you ask? They're magical half-elf Nazis that only materialize when the world is in trouble. <laughs> By completing the Trials of the Chosen, they'll theoretically be sealed away and the land will return to peace. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense that they're attacking the temple though, since Isalia has a non-aggression treaty signed with the Desions. But that's the thing about magical half-elf Nazis, you know? Can't trust them. The group tries to put a stop to the Desions, but is beaten down pretty quickly. A mysterious mercenary named Kratos, yes, it's Kratos, not Kratos, a mercenary named Kratos swoops in and saves the day. Kratos is cool and voiced by Liquid Snake, that's Cam Clark. In one of his more grounded performances. An evil presence radiates from inside this chapel. He's quiet, unemotional, and has no time for babysitting. Except for now, where he agrees to protect Colette as she receives the oracle in the temple, which is our first dungeon. It's pretty straightforward, but there are things worth mentioning that'll become mainstays throughout the game's dungeons. First of all, you can find a gadget called the Sorcerer's Ring. In its base form, it shoots a little fireball in front of the player. It can be used to stun enemies in order to avoid a battle, but more importantly, it's used in various ways to solve puzzles throughout the game's runtime. See, it's as if the universe heard my screams through time and space and made sure that, unlike Legend of Dragoon, the next JRPG I'd cover would have a lot of thought and care placed into the dungeon design. Symphonia's dungeons are all rife with puzzles, though most of them involve moving blocks, so a lot are actually cleverly designed. Don't expect the best of Zelda, but there are some worthwhile challenges in this game. As for the Azalea Temple, it's very simple, just dropping blocks into an area below to create bridges, introducing you to the idea of using your brain which I find crude and offensive. At the top of the temple, Colette receives the oracle from Remiel, an angel of Crucius who reveals himself to be her real father. The Temple of Martel is the predominant religion in Silveront, which is the name of the world where the game takes place. Yeah, don't ask me what Symphonia means here, it's just the word. Martel is considered to be the high object of worship, while the angels of Crucius act as a liaison between her and us normies. The Chosen is named as such because they're born with a gem called a Crucius Crystal in their hand, which marks them as the next in line of the chosen lineage. As for the gems in Lloyd and Kratos' hands, well, they're called x -fears. Not much is known about x at this point, aside from the fact that they amplify one's abilities and aren't exactly common. In fact, it's unusual for anyone other than Desions to be using them. With the Oracle received, the Tower of Salvation appears in Silverant. This marks the final destination of the Chosen's journey and is generally seen as a symbol of hope in troubled times. Back in Isalia, Kratos has been enlisted as Colette's protector alongside Rain, and Lloyd manages to convince the trio to let Genus and himself join up too. They agree to meet back in the village in the morning, and Lloyd heads home to his adoptive father's house in the woods. Genus asks if he can tag along since he has a stop to make. That stop? Magic Nazi camp. See, the designs run these facilities called human ranches, which are as they sound. Basically concentration camps for so-called inferior beings to work themselves to death. It's actually quite disturbing considering the cutesy presentation of the game's visuals, and they don't pull any punches as far as showing the cruelty of the designs. It's not just a run-of-the-mill POW camp, there's torture, beatings, and some other fun things we'll touch on later. Genus wants to stop by because he's made friends with a prisoner by the name of Marble. He's been bringing her his school lunches and keeping her company, because she's an old lady, and old ladies deserve to have their surrogate grandsons bring them lunchables in the death camp. Oh, excuse me, summer fun camp. While visiting, Lloyd notices that Marble has an X-Fear, but without a fitting device called a Keycrest, the X-Fear is extremely volatile and dangerous. Unfortunately, Marble is spotted not work, uh, not having fun with the other campers, and is dragged to the center of camp to be given a stern talking to. Lloyd and Genus manage to distract the guards long enough to abate her beating, but Lloyd's face is spotted by the designs, which is a huge problem for a variety of reasons, not the least of which being the now-broken non-aggression treaty. But with the designs having attacked the temple earlier and thus breaking the treaty themselves, Lloyd figures this won't come back to bite us in the ass in an event that'll kick off the central conflict of the story, will it? 
As an aside, it's an interesting dynamic having the designs be half-elves. These guys are violent, totalitarian assholes, hell-bent on their own racial superiority and the subjugation of all others. It's not something you'd expect to see from half-elves, who themselves are often portrayed as the ones rejected by both humans and elves. Never mind the fact that the minute they have children, they'll be quarter-elves, and I guess the discrimination will end. It turns the tables in an interesting way, especially considering the vast majority of Silverant's inhabitants are humans. They're losing a battle in a land that's entirely theirs, almost like it was destined to be this way, and as a result, human hatred against half-elves is extremely prevalent as well. It's an endless cycle of hatred, which becomes a strong theme in Symphonia as the game goes on. So Lloyd heads home to his aforementioned adoptive father, Dirk. Dirk is a dwarf, one of very few in the world, and as such has access to arcane crafting techniques, such as fixing my bike chain and creating key crests. Lloyd requests Dirk make him one, and Dirk is none too happy to find out that Lloyd has been to the ranch. This leads me to my first major criticism of the game, and that's the presentation of its in-game cutscenes. Symphonia sometimes uses anime-style scenes to convey major story events, and they're beautifully done, even at the lower resolution. But more often than not, story events occur using in-engine cutscenes, and they're far from perfect. What's good is that the voice acting carries the emotional intention of these scenes. It's always on point and does a great job of making you care about what's happening. That X-Sphere is your mother's keepsake. The designs killed your mother in order to take it from her. They did? Symphonia exists in this really awkward period of JRPG storytelling. It was after the zoomed out, text box based cutscenes of the SNES PS1 days. With those cutscenes, your imagination tends to fill in the blanks of what's occurring on screen, bolstered by the art style and soundtrack. You could almost say it's like a visual novel. It's a style of storytelling that's perfectly serviceable, without some of the pomp and circumstance that modern games tie to cutscenes. In the case of the latter, higher budgets have led to impressive animations or motion capture in some cases. When it comes to conveying major plot beats, it should either be shown or told with great clarity, and Symphonia exists in a middle space. It's a visual game, with changing camera angles, character models, and animations, so you can't very well have a text box explaining what someone is doing. On the other hand, it's so hamstrung by its limited animations and simplistic, chibi-style characters that it's often difficult to deduce what someone is doing. I mention it now because this Dirk scene really awkwardly conveys the relationship between Dirk and Lloyd. Just watch. Don't go throwing either away. So will you make me the key crest? Boy, have you been listening at all? Yeah, I heard you. But you can't expect me not to do anything now that I know. Ugh, you don't have to hit me! Isn't that paced weirdly? If you watch the original animation series based on the game, you can infer that Dirk is, uh, shall we say, an old school dwarf dad. He loves Lloyd, but manhandles him when he does something wrong. It's kind of an interesting idea, towing the line between a loving parental relationship and an abusive one, but it's just not conveyed well at all in this cutscene. And as a result, you don't really know what to think. Is Dirk just a cunt? Did Lloyd do something wrong? Did he get hit or did he dodge? Why is he angry? Who knows? It's like an interpretive dance routine. You kind of just pull whatever meaning you can from the exchange. What the? the next morning, Genus runs to tell Lloyd that Colette has already left with Rain and Kratos, and it was her intention to have Lloyd stay home the entire time. Lloyd takes it hard, but before he can ruminate, the designs attack the village, unleashing a strange looking monster called the Exabula and forcing the boys into the first boss fight. Bosses in Symphonia played out like extended battles, the main difference being the boss's defense is harder to break and they have a lot more health. They can also chain together some interesting combos of their own in some cases. After defeating Exabula, we find out a disturbing truth. This thing is actually a mutated form of marble from the ranch. She sacrifices herself to wound the design leader and all that remains is her x fear which Genus holds onto for safekeeping. This is a surprisingly disturbing scene. Oh, run away, Genus Lloyd. Well, what was that voice? It sounded like marble. It can't be. Oh. Oh, oh, get away, hurry! Venus, you were like a grandson to me. Thank you.
Some sad, innocent old woman was transformed into this Junji Ito monstrosity and all she could do in the end was die. Kinda makes you wonder what the purpose of the human ranches actually are. What the hell are they doing over there? The wounded design leader is named Forcistus and he's one of the five design grand cardinals. Isn't that great? You know you're playing a JRPG when the game straight up tells you there's gonna be five villains. Yeah, right. You expect things to stay that simple? There's more than five villains in this game, trust me. How many? Let me think. I can only guess somewhere in the neighborhood a 14 to 18 thousand. Forcistus tells Lloyd that his x is special and he'll be pursued endlessly as long as he has it. Lloyd is exiled from his village and Genus follows him. With nowhere to turn, they decide to catch up with Colette's entourage. I like that the game begins in a more traditional way before revealing some of the darker toned aspects of the world. I mean, you literally start the game goofing around in class, learning about the Chosen One. Then it's all like magical elf Nazis, work camps, directed by John Carpenter. Everybody hates you. Genus needs to shut the fuck up. <laughs> You got rejected! Oh, that last one's just me. But it's a sorry start to what feels like it should be a grand adventure. Lloyd's joining his friends just as much out of necessity as a desire to help, and that's with the knowledge that Colette's journey is statistically likely to fail. At this point, we're free to use the world map and explore a bit. It's a pretty basic overworld map with optional locations and battles along the way. It's a little annoying that the camera is zoomed in, but you're given a broader view if you can find a long-range stone, which lets you use Lloyd's dog named Noish to ride around. The game largely lives up to the promise of a world map, letting you find secret items, hidden locations, and giving you methods of transportation later on. Symphonia frontloads the desert area. It's our next destination. Hey, that's fine with me. I hate desert levels, so it's best to get it out of the way while I still have energy and life within me. We head to the town of Triet in pursuit of the Chosen One, but Lloyd is tased by the Zions and locked in a prison cell somewhere in the desert. <laughs> Why did that open the door? We are introduced to an ongoing dungeon mechanic here, which is that the sorcerer's ring basic functionality can be swapped out for an area-specific effect. Here it turns into a ball of electricity which can fry robotic enemies or activate machinery. It's a simple change most of the time, but I can appreciate that something as simple as the sorcerer's ring can find some utility throughout the game. If you liken the puzzles to a Zelda game, you can think of the sorcerer's ring as an ever-changing gadget. Yeah, usually it just shoots out a dot when you press a button, but it makes you think differently about your surroundings depending on the dungeon. Anything that breaks the monotony of a standard dungeon crawl is a worthwhile inclusion if you ask me. After confronting the leader of the base, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, we run into Boda, who attacked Izalia earlier. Are either of these guys a Grand Cardinal? Because if not, we're at seven villains already. Lloyd and Genus are rescued by the Chosen's group who defeat Boda in battle. Um, excuse me, King. You dropped this. Whatever it is. There's a scene here where the party stays overnight in Triet, talking over the advantage of using x and just generally having some fun conversation. This is something that Symphonia does very well, giving you breathing room between major plot points and just enjoying simple conversations with your party. They can often be skipped altogether if you prefer to just get going, but the game does keep track of how close Lloyd is with other party members for various reasons. It's worth taking your time and exhausting dialogue. If for no other reason, then it can be pretty amusing. The first seal that Colette has to break is located within some desert ruins, the sight of which puts Rain's ruin obsession on full display. This is another dungeon with some block-moving puzzles. Very exciting. The boss of this area is the Ktu... Ktugok and its children, which is actually a pretty tough fight for this early. It's one thing fighting a boss when you can just wail on a single enemy. It's another altogether having to keep track of multiple enemies while avoiding their attacks and only delivering punishment when it's safe. After the fight, Remiel appears and grants Colette her first blessing on the way to Angelhood, which is the ability to sprout wings. She can fly now, and there are about a thousand times throughout the game where it would be extremely convenient if she would, but chooses not to. I guess she wants us to build character through hardship. She collapses from a disease that Rain designates as Angel Toxicosis. Ocean Madness. It's as though breaking the seals is putting stress on her body. The next step is heading to the Seal of Water located across the ocean. On their way to a nearby village to charter a ship, the group is confronted by a mysterious big anime titty ninja. You just know she's going to be a major character because she's voiced by Jennifer Hale. Prepare to die. 
You don't waste Jennifer Hale. The question is, why would somebody want to stop the Chosen One from completing their journey? In the Designs case, it makes sense because once Colette's journey is complete, their reign of terror ends. But for everyone else, you'd want to support the world not dying, wouldn't you? Across the ocean, the party arrives in Palma Costa where they bump into another group impersonating the Chosens. I love these guys. Great value brand Genus is my favorite. He looks like an Estonian dwarf. There's a shopping district in Palma Costa where you can buy a variety of things, including ingredients. See, in Tales of Symphonia, you can actually make food after a battle or on the overworld map. Food can replenish health, TP, boost stats temporarily, or cure status effects. Each character has varying degrees of talent in making certain foods, and they all have their own eating preferences. Eating preferred foods is one of several ways that a character can increase their tension points, which, once at a certain threshold, activates something called Overlimit in battle, which gives a character a brief period of invulnerability. It's not majorly game-changing, but the inclusion of cooking is a fun little way to add loot variety and a convenient way to stitch your party up after a fight. In order to learn new recipes, you have to find the Wonder Chef. He's hiding in cities, disguised as mundane objects, and he doesn't mess around when it comes to cooking. Where's the lamb sauce? I just need a... Where's the lamb That's sauce? By your chef. Fuck off you, you fat, useless sack of fucking Yankee Danky doodle shit. The city is at war with the Designs. Unlike Izalia, there's no peace treaty, so Palma Costa's Governor General Dor has heroically taken up the mantle of battling them. Well, actually, he's been selling out his city in secret while funneling tax dollars to the Designs because they've promised him a cure for his Junji Ito wife. On top of that, unbeknownst to him, his daughter was killed by the Designs years ago, and they've had this thing. Looking fine as fuck, might I add, posing as her and spying on Dor the entire time. Dor is a fake hero with a real problem. His wife is one of those mutant things, and I can understand doing anything to save someone you love, but in doing so, he's put his own people at risk. In fact, some of them have died because of him. The rational mind would probably deduce that the magic elf Nazis are lying. You could give him every red cent in your city, and you'd still be just short of a cure. But with his wife looking like this, you can understand why rationality doesn't really play into his decision. Decisions. Something Tales of Symphonia does often is divert your attention from the clearly laid out goal and make you solve an immediate problem. This isn't uncommon in JRPGs, and some people might call this filler content, but I certainly wouldn't label it that way here. I see this often when people talk about TV shows or anime as well. This is a filler episode, they say with disdain. Then I say, no, this is a pillar episode as in the whole series would collapse without it. Then everybody claps. The filler substory is an incredibly useful device, especially in the JRPG genre, where your characters are arguably the most important tool in your belt. On a surface level, these substories introduce you to concepts that have only been mentioned in passing, or sometimes characters that'll have a larger presence later. But more importantly, they allow characters to develop in more subtle ways. If we just continue on to the Seal of Water and unlock it, Lloyd will get overly excited and bored quickly, Rain will go goo-goo, eyed over the ruins and start spanking everyone, Genus will make some calculations about the water's oxygenation levels or something, and Kratos will go, humph, fools. But with a variety of side stories not necessarily related to the overarching goal, we can expand our understanding of characters by how they react to situations. For example, as Governor General Dor lay dying, he asks if his daughter Kilia is still alive. Despite the fact that she most assuredly is not, Lloyd tells him that she is still alive and promises to protect his family. Now the story could have been that Dor is just waging a war against the Designs and we help him win the day, but then we would have missed out on this moment, which tells us a lot about Lloyd. Unlike Colette Kratos or Rain, Lloyd believes that lying can be justified if the emotional stakes are high enough. A moment ago, he was furious about Dor taking advantage of Palma Costa, but his disposition softens as he looks at the dying governor. Lloyd is driven by emotion, but sympathy or pity seem to take priority over anger for him, which is an important distinction to make when you refer to someone as emotional. I just wanted to mention this because I think Symphonia diverts course with intention. These pivots from the main story are never a waste of time, they always serve some kind of purpose. So the the local human ranch is led by one of the five cardinals named Magnius. Hey, apropos of nothing, doesn't he look like Tuco? Unlike Forcistus, Magnius is a hot-headed individual who doesn't make his anger a secret. He takes many citizens of Palma Costa prisoner, sending them to his Hidden Valley human ranch, one of those prisoners being a girl named Chocola, who is very nice to us. So it's time to make like Avalanche and go commit some good guy terrorism. Magnius Ranch has us activating radar with the Sorcerer's Ring to go through a maze of teleporters. Yes, 
aside from moving blocks, Symphonia likes to use mazes of different kinds more often than I'd prefer. Factor in these radars are color-coded and I'm colorblind and don't know what the fuck is going on. I just wander around until I end up in the right place. As it turns out, Shokola is Marble's granddaughter. She finds out, without context, that Lloyd is Marble's murderer and refuses to be saved by him. Well fine, take your chances with the magic elf Nazis, see if I care. After being defeated, Magnus realizes that he and Forcistus have been deceived in some manner. Before he can do anything about it, he's contacted by one of the other Grand Cardinals, a character named Rodile. <laughs> Collecting gold for me, attempting to eliminate the Chosen for me, you've been quite useful, Magnus. Hey, I recognize Darren Norris's voice anywhere. I'm respecting your privacy by knocking, but asserting my authority as your father by coming in anyway! Rodile is hilariously evil. His intentions won't be known for some time, but for now, his evilness is more than enough for me. That wraps a bow on the Palma Costa arc, but before moving on, I want to mention another thing Symphonia does to expand on characters efficiently. While walking around, you'll be given a chance to trigger optional scenes called skits, in which some talking heads of the characters converse with each other. There's a surprising amount of depth added to the characters' personalities with this method, mostly because it shows how they would talk to one another, rather than just a Lloyd or as a group. With skits, you get the chance to see how characters talk about things like the food they like, or hardships they've gone through in childhood, or cracks in their guise. I would go so far as to say the majority of character development occurs over the skits, all completely optional, all done with nothing but a handful of JPEGs. Unfortunately, they aren't voiced in the English dub like they are with the Japanese, which is something I do think really weakens the dub. But it's still fun to see all these little scenes, many of which are hidden away with various requirements. Requirements. Onward to the seal of water, much to Rain's chagrin as she's afraid of water. Ah! Ah. I... I was just starting to say, ah, this should be fun. After solving another moving block puzzle, we fight this thing with sharks for hands. It's about the coolest thing I can think of. And finally unlock the seal of water. Colette falls ill again. It's almost like her biological makeup is changing to morph that of an angel, which is kind of freaky. The party heads to the city of Asgard, which is host to some ancient ruins. I like this city a lot. The wind is blowing, which makes it feel a little cold. A little cold is good, you know? Sweater weather. You can go explore all the little ruins around town, and because of its attachment to history, it's much more of a traditional area with a strong emphasis on ceremony. There's a subplot here where the group stops a woman from being sacrificed and ends up killing the demon demanding the sacrifice. Oh sure, now Rain is all concerned about stopping a sacrifice. Oh wait, we're not that far yet, are we? Forget I said anything. The next seal is located in the Balakruf Mausoleum near Asgard. There's a puzzle here involving moving blocks, but you also have to pay attention to some tablets around the ruin and figure out the right order to blow these little windmill things. Nothing crazy, but a fun little puzzle. After releasing the seal, that ninja from earlier fights us again before running off like a coward. Never send a ninja to do a samurai's job. Colette falls sick once again, but this time is different. Lloyd detects something is wrong, so he decides to pull a little trick. Here, it's hot coffee. Thanks. Ooh. Hot, isn't it? Yeah, really hot. It's actually iced Ooh. coffee. Ooh. What? I had Genus make it cold. Oh, uh, yeah, Ooh. of course it's cold. Ooh. I lied. Ooh. It's actually hot. Yeah, really hot. It's actually so cold. I promise. Yeah, it's really cold. I lied. It's actually so hot. I don't really get it. Lloyd, please stop. Shut up. Where do you get off? You're a worthless jerk who couldn't give up her social status even for her own wife. So it turns out that Colette is literally losing her humanity as she becomes an angel. She can't eat, she can't sleep, her sense of touch has disappeared, and she's just been dealing with it like a man. That is to say, bottling up all her negative feelings and letting them out in subtle, passive-aggressive ways that sabotage all of her personal relationships before retreating into alcohol. Okay, well, maybe it's more accurate to say she's been dealing with it like a champ. There's something that Colette's parents, Rain, and Kratos have all been acting really skittish over when it comes to Colette's journey. Could it be her losing her senses? Or something much, 
darker. Fortunately, to counterbalance the negative aspects, becoming an angel has granted Colette with some amazing abilities, along with improved eyesight and hearing. Heading to the nearby town of Lewin, it seems like a disaster has struck. Desions have raised the town to the ground, taking the inhabitants to the nearby human ranch. We find the assassin gravely injured and looking distraught before healing her and learning that her name is Sheena. You can actually arrive in Lewin earlier and find the town in perfectly fine shape, with shops, an inn, and Sheena mingling with the townsfolk. It's very easy to miss this scene, but it provides valuable context for why Sheena is here, or even cares about the town. You kind of have to make your own conclusions if you show up after the town's been destroyed like I did. Speaking of which, there's a metric shitload of missable cutscenes and side activities in this game. I'll talk about some of these in greater detail later, but here's an example for now. Shortly after you leave Lewin, you can return to find someone soliciting donations. You can return periodically to Lewin, dropping off money and watch as the town is slowly rebuilt to its former glory, and then some. Nobody ever tells you this is the case, you can easily just leave the destroyed Lewin at this point and never return. It's a bit of a double-edged sword if you ask me. I always have respect for the courage it takes developers to make large chunks of content that could easily be missable, which is sadly why the design philosophy of, say, mm, modern Bethesda games seems to make sure you'll never have to do a second playthrough. Stumbling across things you haven't seen or taking a branching path can be exciting and encourage replayability. On the other hand, it's a bit disappointing to complete the game and find out you miss some really juicy, major content. It's one thing if you got a few side activities, but there's so much stuff that isn't even hinted at in this game, you'd have to scour the world endlessly to see it all. Now 14 year old me would have no problem jumping back in for 10 replays, but these days there's just too much to play and too little time. The party enters an uneasy alliance with Sheena, though I do find it a bit weird that her motives aren't questioned, at least not for a long time. I figure the first thing Kratos would ask is, hey, why are you trying to kill us? But there's a uh, we'll sort it out later mentality here that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Sheena's got a pet named Corinne, a lab-grown creature that's developed a relationship with her. It's basically a Pokemon. The party head to the nearby human ranch, but the way is blocked. Gee, I wonder if this giant fucking sewer grate with a cartoon boulder in front of it will ever have a part to play in our infiltration. A man named Pietro supposedly holds the key to infiltrating the ranch. The only problem? He's brain damaged, which hasn't stopped me from making it this far. We need a unicorn unicorn horn to heal him. Hey look, a unicorn, only it's at the bottom of the river. As it happens, Sheena is a summoner by trade. Summoning is a lost art and it requires some very specialized training. The summon spirit of water would be able to rescue the unicorn, so the party heads back to the seal of water and lets Sheena perform her summoning ritual. The spirit of water, Undini, is already bound to someone by a pact, Mythos, who you may remember as the hero who ended the ancient war. But no, they say, it couldn't be that Mythos, they must just have uh, the same name. Let me tell you something, you son of a bitch. I've played enough JRPGs to know that there are no coincidences other than a little deus ex machina to get heroes out of a jam. But I digress. The party defeats Undini in battle, which convinces her to form a pact. When Sheena forms a pact with a summon spirit, she's then able to use its abilities in battle for a large TP cost. The snag is that she can only use them if she's currently in an overlimit state. Once again, I understand the need to balance this, but overlimits are pretty rare unless you know how to exploit the tension system, and the damage output of a summon spirit doesn't justify how seldom you get to use one. At any rate, Undini frees the unicorn which gives us its horn. Everybody lives happily ever after, except for the unicorn because it dies without its horn. Gee, great work gang, any other endangered species you'd like to wipe out to have someone tell you, this is the secret entrance. So the ranch is infiltrated through the giant boulder grate. Heading to the factory section, we're confronted by the Grand Cardinal Kavar, who reveals some disturbing information. First of all, the nature of an x -fear. It's not just a gem. It's a parasitic organism. They're fitted to host bodies where they feed on the life force of that individual until they become strong enough to be extracted and used. If an x without a key crest is removed at this point, the host's mana drains suddenly and they turn into a monster, like marble. So essentially, a key crest allows you to use an x rather than have the x use you. That's pretty screwed up and the party is suitably alarmed to hear of this, especially when Kavar reveals to Lloyd that his x contains the life force of his mother. That's Lloyd 
Lloyd's mother, not Kvar's, who was killed by his father before Lloyd was abandoned. Yeah, I would have a lot of confusing feelings on that. As Kratos later mentions, there's absolutely no way in hell they would have gotten this far without using the x spheres and the damage has already been done, so to not use them would arguably be a waste. On the other hand, the principle of using human life in this way is so unethical that to participate in it, even indirectly, might be a bridge too far. It's an interesting question the game poses and refers to several times, and I think which side of this debate you'll land on will just come down to your own principles. It all comes to a head when the party defeats Gavar in battle, effectively avenging Lloyd's mother and also freeing the prisoners from Lewin, however few might remain. Kratos, you pathetic inferior being! Feel the pain of those inferior beings as you burn in hell. The second to last seal is located in the Tower of Mana, a abandoned library and research facility. Releasing the seal once again causes Colette to fall ill, this time losing her voice. <laughs> What's wrong, Colette? It's pretty heartbreaking seeing her try to speak, but having to write words on Lloyd's hand. Lloyd has already been Colette's voice in some sense up to this point. This just makes it official. He starts off mouthing each letter, but to be honest, I'm glad they speed it up by just doing entire words. As much as we all love Colette, I don't think I could handle conversing with her like Stevie from Malcolm in the Middle. A guy goes into a bar and he wait. I screwed up. A frog goes into a box. At this point, Sheena finally fesses up as to why she was hunting Colette and reveals the central thrust of Symphonia's story. And you can tell looking at Lloyd that he wouldn't mind doing the old central thrust on Sheena. I'm just being cheeky. Lloyd is loyal to Colette. You can tell based on their personalities. If Lloyd ended up dating Sheena, they'd have nuclear arguments. You ever try arguing with your significant other when they throw down a smoke bomb to leave the situation? Most annoying shit ever. Jess, I don't care where you keep getting these goddamn smoke bombs, but if it happens one more time, I'm locking you in the closet again. Oh yeah, the game. So Sheena isn't actually from Silverant, but a parallel world called Tefeala. It doesn't exist in a separate place to Silverant per se, but rather another plane of existence, if you will. Well, it's either that or on the moon. The game isn't really clear about this. Tefeala has been experiencing prosperity for many years while Silverant has been suffering, and as a result, their technology and research sector is far beyond anything Silverantians could ever dream of. Tefeala has a mana regeneration quest of their own. Their own Tower of Salvation, their own Chosen One, their own seals, everything different, but also the same. Tethiala discovered the existence of Silverant as an alien civilization would discover Earth, becoming unseen observers rather than making direct contact. The reason Sheena was trying to kill Colette is because whichever world the Chosen One succeeds in will become the prospering world while the other begins its decline. Sheena is from a village called Mizuho, which trains ninjas and spies, often for the purpose of assassination. That's why she was chosen to kill Colette, but Sheena, upon seeing the suffering in Silverant, hasn't been able to kill Colette. Things here are worse than she ever imagined, which leads to a crisis of conscience. It's quite a quandary, the two worlds are intertwined like an hourglass, the filling of one depletes the other and vice versa. It's an obvious setup for some conflict, but for now the party decides to move forward. They decide they'll ask Remiel at the Tower of Salvation if there's any way for the worlds to coexist. Wouldn't it be hilarious if he said yes? Coexisting at the same time? Well damn! We never thought of that. Hey, you guys are pretty smart. Dave, get over here. Come listen to this. Listen to what? Go ahead, Lloyd. Tell him what you told me. We're going to look for a way to change the two worlds. Oh shit, dude. How did we how did we not think of that? We've been through like 300 chosen. 500 chosens. chosens. Yeah, exactly. On the night before the final seal is released, the party stays in a town called Haima. At this point, you can walk around as Lloyd getting everyone's perspective on the events to come. While Lloyd, Genus, and Sheena are nervous but excited, there's a somber mood hanging over Kratos, Rain, and Colette. As Kratos stands watch, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, from earlier attempts to assassinate him, stopped only by Lloyd's intervention. The party takes some baby dragons from Haima to the Tower of Salvation, and you can choose who to ride with. There's no wrong answer, other than Genus, I don't know what kind of freak would choose him. Arriving in the tower depicts a really unsettling scene. There's a vortex of coffins floating in the tower, each one representing a chosen that failed their journey. It's a pretty grim sight for what should be a momentous occasion. Arriving to the central altar, the party 
party finds out that sacrificing Colette is the only way to complete the journey of regeneration. Or rather, Lloyd, Genus, and Sheena find out. The others knew this entire time. Colette has been raised from birth with the knowledge that she's meant to die someday. It's a hidden truth known only by the Church of Martell and those closest to the Chosen. Colette didn't tell Lloyd, knowing that he would never allow her to go through with it if he'd known. It looks like it's time. Goodbye. It's a heartbreaking scene. I remember this shaking me to my core the first time I played. I honestly thought this was the climax of the game and that the second disc just had some bonus stuff on it. They really play it up like the journey to the tower will be the conclusion to the story. Never mind the fact that there's some characters introduced we don't know anything about. It's kind of hard to remember them all. Remiel's personality seems to shift completely as he reveals that he's not Colette's real father and Colette's soul has been stolen so that her body can become Martel's vessel. Additionally, after defeating Remiel, Meal, Kratos reveals that he too has been deceiving the party. He's actually a member of Crucius himself, an angel, and his intention has been to turn over Colette as Martel's vessel from the very beginning. So it wasn't happenstance that he arrived to save her at the temple. Playing the game again with this knowledge, you'll see some very sly foreshadowing. Crucius isn't the divine religious order that it's been painted, but rather a nefarious organization led by one Yggdrasil, voiced amazingly by James Arnold Taylor. <laughs> People need not introduce themselves to a dog. What did you say? Fine. I shall tell you my name, wretched human. I am Eudrasio, leader of Crucius, and the Desions. And donning what is undoubtedly not only the sexiest outfit in Tales of Symphonia, but the sexiest outfit ever designed by a human being. The way it beautifully accentuates his Ken doll physique is just magnifique. After getting steamrolled by Yggdrasil, the party is saved by Boda and his band of Merry Desions. But they're not actually Desions. Their group is called the Renegades, and they're made to look like Desions by design. But Desions. Back at their base, we learn further truths. The Renegades are under the employ of one Yuen Ka Fai, otherwise known as question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. The Renegades only task is to prevent the resurrection of Martel at all costs, which is why their organization stormed the temple in the beginning. The Desions and Crucius are actually just different ranks of the same organization. Both groups are half-elves, with some exceptions. The difference being that Crucius has evolved their biology using Crucius crystals, which allow them to effectively become angels. Come on, you didn't seriously think I'd get through a JRPG without having to describe an overwhelming plot dump, did you? Get into the spirit of things, slap on your cosplay, come on now, I'm not even close to done yet. The designs haven't been trying to kill the Chosen One at all, in fact it's their prerogative to keep Colette alive and guide her to the tower, since that's the will of Crucius. When exposed to mortal danger, Colette's Crucius crystal becomes stressed and fuses with her, making her body more conducive to the role of being Martel's vessel. That's why the designs appear in the declining world, in order to amplify that suffering and urgency. The reason that Yggdrasil split the world in two? Well, let's just say for now it was a necessary action to keep Martel's soul alive. Martel exists in a delicate balance between Silverunt and Tetheala. Breaking each seal exchanges the flow of mana, which is what causes one world to flourish while the other is exhausted. On top of keeping Martel alive in a fragile balance, the two worlds vying for mana prevents either from advancing their magi technology to such a stark degree as to compete with Crucius. Technological progress is intentionally stifled, which is just a convenient side effect of keeping Martel alive. Now, you don't receive all of this information at once. Some of it is peppered in during dialogue throughout the next act, but I think it's easier to get it all out of the way now, rather than having to stop and make an addendum every 12 seconds. It's dense, it's melodramatic, it's the first of many plot twists. It's a JRPG, what can you say? The story isn't told with much grace, which is doubly true when you consider the questionable quality of the cutscenes, but as I've mentioned, the voice acting sells it. These are pretty huge bombs to drop on the player, and it ups the ante to an extreme degree, which is a positive when you have a long, story-based game on your hands. In fact, my main problem is that there isn't enough of an in-depth explanation here. Most of these things are only touched on a surface level. I feel like they could have used Lloyd's inability to pay attention as a decent excuse to get into a bit more detail, but much of it is breezed past, seemingly under the expectation that the player will just accept what they don't understand and move forward. Well, they're right, because that's what most people will do, but I would have appreciated a glossary of some kind. There is a synopsis which fills you in on the broader points of the story, which is definitely helpful if you take a break and don't remember where you left off, but it doesn't get into the minutia of the plot. Once again, God bless the wiki contributors, there's lots of great information here if you don't mind reading blocks of text. And if you do, well, 
why would you be playing a JRPG? Despite all of these conspiracies and insurmountable problems, our most immediate issue is Colette, who's fully lost her soul at this point. She's basically a doll, unable to think, speak, or tell me to clean the gutters on Sunday for fucking crying out loud, Jess, the game is on! I'm trying to relax here with a Coors Banquet, clean them your damn self. Ewan claims Colette is no longer of any use to them and tries to kill the party, which doesn't make any sense if you ask me. First of all, you were already trying to kill Colette to prevent her from becoming the Chosen. She was never of any use to you. Second of all, what's different now than before? If anything, she's even more suitable as Martel's vessel, now that she's an empty shell. So how have things changed? The party escapes Ewan, heading through the Renegade base and ending up in the same area that Lloyd was in before. Hey, neat. In order to travel between Silverant and Tetheala, Sheena informs us that we'll need a flying machine called a Riard, some of which are being stored in this base. Now how does she know that? Well, she mentions that the Renegades approach the Pope in Tetheala. Yeah, they've got a Pope. How can Silverant's pathetic Protestant Martel worship ever measure up? Demonstrating what a risk Colette's success would pose to Tetheala, Ewan convinced the Pope to send an assassin to halt her progress. Now I'd expect Ewan and Sheena to recognize each other, I mean she did park her Riard in this base, but Ewan seems pretty eager to dispose of her and she never mentions him. I don't know, maybe he wasn't home when she got here, maybe he was getting groceries in Tria. The party steals Ewan's Riards and warps to Tetheala. Unfortunately they crash into the mountains almost immediately. Because the party has been releasing the seals of the summon spirits in Silverant, seems like a lot of S's for one sentence, those spirits have been gaining power. As a result, the counterbalancing summon spirits in Tetheala have been losing influence. In this case, the summon spirit of water, Undini, is powered up, while Tetheala's summon spirit of electricity, Volt, has been weakened. Volt's energy is what keeps the Riards powered up, and his weakness is what caused their crash. I really like this bit of world building, they could have easily gotten away with, oh no, we're out of fuel, but they went the extra mile to give an in-universe extra explanation for these events. Not only does it expand your understanding of how the summon spirits affect the world, but also apply some real consequences to the party's actions. Back in the Fuji Mountains, the party decides to head to Tetheala's capital of Mel Tokyo. Being in Tetheala is pretty exciting, it's like the start of a whole new adventure. Remember in those second generation Pokemon games where you finish the Elite Four and find out there's an entirely new region to beat? I remember feeling that way when I got to Tetheala for the first time. There's a whole new roster of creatures to find, a new world map with a lot more disconnected islands just waiting to be discovered, and the promise of a new, darker tone as well, given what the party just experienced. Speaking of that, Colette is really creepy now. As Ewan mentioned, she's basically a lethal weapon at this point, a powered-up being who's only driven by survival instinct. Sheena splits from the party, having to report back in Mizuho, and we enter the city. In Maltokyo, you can immediately see a difference between it and Silverant's major cities. Where before it was closer to generic fantasy, Tetheala is much more steampunky. There's machinery, paved roads, vehicles, and in general, people are happier, for the most part. As is the case for any high-tech medieval monarchy, the city's aristocracy lives at a higher altitude, while the poor are shoved off in some forgotten corner of the city. In Silverant, everybody suffers to a degree, but that's also led to a unity among the non-design classes, where division is more palpable in Tetheala. It's also interesting how the position of half-elves have been flipped, where in Silverant they're the clear oppressors, abusing power and committing heinous crimes. In this world, the half-elves are utterly powerless. There are no Zions because this world is flourishing, so half-elves are hated across the spectrum. As is demonstrated in the game, elves consider half-elves to be of tainted blood, while humans fear and envy their long lifespans. Now, this is just an excuse. A running theme throughout Symphonia is that whichever world you live in, people will find reasons to hate each other over differences. Whether those reasons are seemingly justified or not, discrimination is an innate part of who we are. Every group believes themselves to be morally superior to the other, and that causes blind spots that become increasingly hard to look past. It's a simple message, but I think it's good to have stories like this remind us of simple truths, which are often the most powerful if you ask me. When you consider how divisive things are in the real world, it can be extremely easy to convince yourself that you're on a moral high ground without ever considering the perspective of the people you've already decided to hate. The road to hell is paved with good intentions and all that. For the most part, people don't just wake up and decide to be evil. There are often well-intentioned motives that slowly move them toward that evil. Fear, confusion, and a loss of control over the situation will often and drive good people to become what they hate, and that's very present in Symphonia. It's clear in Tetheala where prosperity has given people the luxury of separating and hating each other. In Mel Tokyo, we're introduced to Tetheala's chosen, Zelos Wilder. You sure are strong, my little angel. You certainly startled me. Well, who are you? No offense, but I'm not interested in talking to guys.
he's probably not what you were expecting. Yeah, he's a flamboyant, womanizing smartass. At least on the surface, there's more going on underneath his dopiness, which makes me like him as a character. If nothing else, he's reliably some comic relief. We're also introduced to Prisea, who helps us get into the castle so our situation can be explained to the king. She's a lot like Colette, weirdly doll-like, robotic, soulless. She uses a comically large axe in battles. One of my favorite characters in combat. She's really good. Why does she join the party, you ask? Nobody knows, we just sort of kidnap her. After waiting in the castle for a while, a deal is struck. The Pope will allow Silverontians to travel Tetheala, trying to find a way to return Colette from her angel form. In return, Zelos will keep tabs on them, ensuring that she becomes a human again so she can't finish her journey as the Chosen. So Zelos formally joins the party. You can think of him as a replacement for Kratos, a melee-focused character who has some useful utility spells as well. We take the bridge to the Imperial Research Facility, and let me tell you, this bridge is the longest fucking bridge in video game history. And the music that plays is so weird and depressing. I suppose this would be a good time to talk about the soundtrack. It's solid, squarely what I would consider good territory. There aren't many weak tracks, but there are only a few standout excellent tracks, in my opinion. The composer, Motoi Sakuraba, is an excellent jazz pianist, and his solo progressive rock albums really show what he's capable of, made for some hectic background music while I wrote this script. Symphonia's soundtrack has a lot of range. You have the avant-garde jazz of the track Struggle to Survive, which features some odd time signatures and an anxiety-inducing melody. There's the moody and atmospheric Search of Seal, which brings to mind undiscovered mysteries in ancient temples. The emotional weight of this track is heightened considerably in Tetheala. A military snare drum is introduced to assert order, and periodic key changes uneasily shift from fear to hope. The upscale, classical harpsichord of the track Academic City shows off the Baroque influences Sakuraba employs in his solo albums. And finally, just because I love it so much, the track Deepest Woods perfectly frames the village of Ozette, a sad, quiet little nook where people aren't long for this world. Much of the soundtrack falls into what I would call generic RPG music. You've got your standard battle themes, town music, a few tropical songs for good measure. There's also a synthesized vocal effect used for many songs that I'm not fond of. Makes me feel like I'm being serenaded by a bunch of depressed garden gnomes or something. So we arrive in the town of Cybak, home to the research academy where we can hopefully learn more about Colette's problem. They figure that attaching a key crest to her Crucius crystal might help her regain control of her body, but it doesn't work. Lloyd's craftsmanship is lackluster, the kind of guy who charges $35 on Etsy for a picture frame made from pipe cleaners. The only person who can really work with key crests is Dirk, Lloyd's father in Silverant, but without Volt's energy, getting back will be impossible. To make matters worse, the Pope's knights find out that Genus and Rain are actually half-elves 
Half-Elves and arrest them. It's interesting how brazenly Zealous dislikes Half-Elves. He's grown up surrounded by this type of discrimination, and it's not something he can easily let go of. As the story goes on, Zealous sympathizes with Genus and Rain and comes to see them as friends, but remarks that he still doesn't like Half-Elves. There's no single moment of revelation or a big character moment where everybody hugs and lets bygones be bygones. Genus acknowledges that being hated by humans in both worlds makes him want to hate humans back, but acting out this hatred would only vindicate humans. It's a bit of a catch-22. Anyway, the party rescues Genus and Rain, Sheena rejoins us, and it's back to the Fuji Mountains to grab the Riards. In order to get them working again, Sheena will need to form a pact with the Summon Spirit Volt, which she's really standoffish about. Unlike Undini, something about Volt sparks fear in her. You see what I did there? Volt? Sparks fear? High IQ humor, not for everyone. Back in the mountains, the party is trapped in this whack-ass crystal prison. Both Ewan and the leader of the design cardinals, Pronima, approach the party. Ewan wants Lloyd, get in line, bucko, and Pronima wants Colette. When she attempts to remove Lloyd's half-assed key crest, Colette springs to life and stops her. Lloyd tries to attack Ewan, but is stopped by stupid sexy Disco Kratos. Leave, Ewan. Lord Yggdrasil has summoned you. Lord Yggdrasil? Okay, you and is an angel too? What are you doing? Like, with my life? Or right now. Either way, not much. So now Ewan is connected to Crucius and the designs too, while simultaneously being their enemy, and Kratos periodically shows up to give some ambiguous advice to the party, despite working for the man that wants Colette. Messy, messy, I'm still reeling from everything that went down at the Tower of Salvation and now you're dropping more shit like this on me? My issue is that, given my experience with other JRPGs, I genuinely have no idea whether all these threads will be untangled or the onus is on me to speculate. Either way, when things like this crop up, I treat it like a game of Clue. I'm trying to figure out how Colonel Mustard could have gotten away with it knowing Miss Scarlet and Tim Curry were playing bridge in the next room. SPACE! Maybe they'll explain it, maybe they won't. I'm just having fun guessing. Oh yeah, the party keeps forgetting about Prisea, which makes us kidnappers on top of being wanted by the Tethiala authorities. With the bridge patrolled by the Pope's men, the party need to find a way to cross the sea to get to the northern continent. Zelos has a contact who can help us out, but Maltokyo's city gate is blocked off by guards. You know what that means. Sewer level. The minute I heard the music track in this area, I was filled with a sense of dread. Memories of this level buried deep in my subconscious floated to the surface. Playing Chrono Trigger always makes me think, you know, maybe I'm too hard on sewer levels. This isn't so bad, but no. No, there's a reason. Sewer levels are hated. Why? Well, on a surface level, they're just visually uninteresting. You can't do anything with a sewer. They're dark, depressing, stinky. Enemies are invariably rats or bats. Design-wise, it's just frustrating to walk around a bunch of corridors that all look the same. I will say that Symphonia does some different things here. First of all, solving the puzzle in this area is actually quite a task. The sorcerer's ring makes the group tiny. Stepping up on these pads makes the group normal-sized again. Despite the enemies being rats, I love how getting into a fight while Tiny makes them these giant badass killing machines. That's pretty funny. Being small gives you access to rat holes, allows you to walk on spider webs, and makes narrow pathways accessible. There's a trash compactor that makes giant garbage cubes, a fun way to tie Tetheala's superior technology to the area, and the cubes can be pushed around to create alternate paths. Hey, wait a minute, this is just a block moving puzzle with extra steps. Well, it's a decent puzzle. It just takes so long to get anything done. You're going back and forth, checking to see if spiders have made new webs that you can use, activating switches, feels never ending. Finally, at the end of the dungeon, you're accosted by some prisoners led by a handsome blue-haired gentleman who has his own jazz theme music. They were sent by the Pope with the promise of their sentences being lightened if they killed the Chosen, but they're not too much trouble for the party. Heading to the laboratory in Mel Tokyo, the party is given the Wing Pack, a tiny capsule that can magically store a boat. While we're in the city, let's stop at Belteon for some items. Or, I am get me I am. Come in. The Wing Pack is a goofy idea, but it is pretty handy. Most of the time when you get a boat or an airship in an RPG, you have to go find where you parked it when you want to leave again. In Symphonia, you just take the vehicle with you, so you can whip it out whenever you want. Along with things like mapping party members' moves to the trigger buttons and having a quick jump option to get through areas faster, you can see how this game came out at the beginning of the quality of life era. Hey, are you watching this video in one sitting? It's time for a little intermission. Fix that upper back posture. Relax the tension in your shoulders. Unclench your jaw. Feel better? Good. You're right where I want you. My compulsive need to edit and draw funny pictures throughout the video leads to a lot of work, so if you're enjoying it and would like to support further content, please consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash magular. 
Anything you can toss into my virtual tip jar is greatly appreciated. There are some fun reward tiers that I think you'll enjoy, so check it out. If you're not in a position to spend money, a like and a subscription does go a long way. Regardless, thank you for watching the video. Entertaining you guys is a real pleasure, and I hope you'll stick around to see what's in store for the future. Anyway, back to the video. Heading back to the research facility, the other one that is, we find that Persea's creepiness is actually a result of an experiment being performed on her. The lab is trying to create a Crucius crystal inside of her body in research called the Angelus Project, which is probably not coincidentally the name of the project that Lloyd's mom was involved in as well. Apparently, an altered key crest can be used to delay an x parasitic consumption, resulting in a Crucius Crystal. The researchers tell Lloyd and company that the process can be stopped if we find a dwarf named Altessa who has the skills necessary to fix her key crest and stop the process. Altessa's home, Sheena's village of Mizuho, and Persea's village of Ozette are all located within the Gaspacho forest. I'm not really sure what the point of the sorcerer's ring puzzle is here, it just turns into a light that makes tree branches go away. Couldn't there have just been no branches? Doesn't really add anything aside from a slight annoyance, but I imagine they just tried to get the most out of the sorcerer's ring they could. I love the enemies in this forest, these fighting plants that use buds as boxing gloves, or these little guys that carry big coffins on their back. They open up and this creepy hand reaches out, it's awesome. The enemy designs in general are pretty great, there's a huge variety at work here. Looking through the bestiary, you can see the range of creatures you fight even in mundane settings like the world map. These little starfish are my favorite. Wait a hoe, wait a hoe, wait a there are some recolors, which I think is to be expected in such a long game, but in general, I can't even imagine how long it would have taken to model and animate such a massive number of monsters, all with their own techniques and weight class. It's a real display of imagination. In the forest, a boss fight occurs with that blue-haired character from earlier. He's knocked unconscious, and the only person who hasn't skipped leg day in the group is Colette, so she slings him over her shoulder like a sack of potatoes, and they head to Mizuho before the Pope's knights arrive in the forest. Man, Tetheala has all the luck. Silver Onk stuck with all these generic RPG towns, but here we've got Tudor London, University Town, Seaside Resorts, a flying city, and of course, Mizuho is the obligatory, feudal Japanese-themed village. The people of this area are brought up to essentially be ninjas, so they're understandably none too happy when Sheena brings a ragtag group of teenagers and a fugitive to their secret village. Oh sure, there's a problem with us, but you let any old furry just walk in and set up camp. Oh yeah, if you're wondering what's with these giant cat people, they're called cats. And that's not a costume, they're actually a race separate from humans or elves. Why doesn't anybody discriminate against them? They show up uninvited to towns and cities, soliciting donations for their scam business ventures. Well, actually, it's not a scam. You can pay them to explore the map or find treasure, but I never really found that a compelling use of gald, which is the currency here. It's like gold, but you pretend you're from Minnesota when you say it. You bet is mainly used to answer questions. If you can't think of anything else to say, so you bet. Meeting with Mizuho's chief, we find out that Sheena's failure to kill the Chosen has made the entire village a target, not just from the Tetheala royal family, but also the Church of Martel. In case it's not obvious from the Pope's repeated attempts to have us killed, the Church in Tetheala is a lot more militant and inquisition-y than that of Silverant, the latter of which is more like your classic Dragon Quest church. Despite being the same religion, you can see how wealth and affluence have corrupted what was essentially a force for good, if you remove the fact that Crucius is actually terribly evil. It's also revealed that the village chief is in a coma. Long ago, Sheena attempted to form a pact with Volt, but being the most volatile summoned spirit of all, he went berserk. In short, she failed the pact, which not only placed the chief in a ten-year-long coma, but also got several village members killed. That's why Sheena is always so skittish when it comes to Volt, and probably explains her lack of confidence in general. She's a talented summoner, but seems to value life a bit too much to make an effective assassin, and her actions causing so much death might explain that. Lloyd has a pretty good speech here when confronted by the chief about his goals. I'm tired of people having to become sacrifices. I'm tired of discrimination. I'm tired of people becoming victims. I'm tired of it all. He wants to end the two worlds competition for mana, which in his mind will heal the suffering and discrimination that people face. It's overly idealistic and frankly kind of stupid, but there's something compelling about Lloyd's vision. Once again, Scott Menville's voice acting really carries this character. It's easy to seem as childish or immature, but he's not an idiot. It's not like he hasn't faced suffering himself. He simply refuses to let the pessimism or realism, if you ask anyone else, weigh him down. He retains an innocence that most people don't, having seen what he's seen. The only 
only person who can match this emotional buoyancy is Colette, who's been through a hell of her own. The chief is swayed by Lloyd's vision, and agrees to let the party use Mizuho as an information network. Ah yes, the information network, a brilliant plot device, allows the party to focus on more imminent problems while having the solutions to others arrive in the form of, well, information, without it feeling too cheap or poorly written. At this point, we are introduced to Regal as our final party member, sort of, depends. More on that later. The party keeps him prisoner, but allows him to fight. He's got some fancy footwork and uses plated greaves as a weapon. Regal only agrees because he says he's got business with Prisea, and until her keycrest is repaired, she's a poor conversational partner. So it's off to Altessa's home then. This means making a pit stop in Ozette so Prisea can go home to her family. Yet, it's not her family we see, but Rodile. Well, I know it's Rodile, but the party hasn't been introduced to him yet. It's like Dungeons and Dragons, where you have to pretend your characters don't know something that you do. It's the honor system. The party decides to check on Prisea just in case, and what unfolds is actually quite disturbing. Lloyd remarks on the horrible smell coming from inside, and we find that Prisea's father was lying in bed dead long ago, as Prisea continues working, totally unaware of what's happened to him. This is pretty dark. It's like the human ranches and x monsters. The game doesn't hold back when it comes to that stuff. I do find it slightly at odds with the colorful style of the presentation, but I suppose that's a matter of preference. So while Tessa refuses to fix Perseus' key crest, as his smoke and hot robot maid Tabitha explains, he simply doesn't want to get involved with her. Though he was the one who worked with the researchers on her experiment in the first place, he's filled with such a deep regret that he just wants his hands washed of the whole ordeal. Tabitha tells the party she'll try softening Altessa up, and in the meantime, we've got to find inhibitor ore to make the key crest. To the Toys Valley Mine, which isn't nearly as fun as it sounds. Here the sorcerer's ring just puts down a bomb that destroys boulders. There's some pretty basic switch puzzles, nothing particularly challenging. Oh, need you find this guy. This is a gnomelet. These things are rude little fuckers. Also, there's this spinning tofu that'll slap your shit if you get too close. After finding the inhibitor ore and getting a key crest made, we return to Ozette. Colette is promptly kidnapped by Rodile. You can't describe yourself as cunning. That's off limits. That's like saying, I'm incorrigible. Other people have to describe you that way. Affixing the repaired key crest to Prisea, she regains her sense of self and asks where her father is. The party just shows her for some reason? I... What have I been doing? I feel like that would be a good time to just explain to her or warn her first, but they're like, oh, come on in, we'll show you. Doesn't really seem like a better if you see it yourself type moment. Prisea explains that after her father fell ill, she needed to learn how to use an axe to take her father's place and provide for him. Unable to lift one, she was given an x sphere by a man named Varley, this guy, who was in cahoots with Rodile. She was taken to the research academy where the experiments began, which means it was actually under the Pope's orders that the experiment was carried out. Mamma mia! So the Pope, Rodile, and Varley are all working together in some capacity. Rodile is one of the five Grand Cardinals, so he's working with the Desions and by extension Crucius. Only we saw him gloating at the deaths of several of the other Grand Cardinals. It seems like the Cardinals were duped by Rodile into believing that Colette should be killed when normally the Cardinals would want a successful chosen alive at all costs. Will you tell me what the hell is going on? What is all this about? So, in short, Rodile wants Colette dead and is pursuing research to create his own Crucius crystals. Uh, but if he wants her dead, why did he kidnap her? So anyway, Regal asks Persea if she has an older sister. She says, no, I have a younger sister. And Regal's like, damn, okay, well, that's all I wanted to know. Instead of leaving the party, he sticks around because of a vendetta against Varley. Persea sticks around because, well, she doesn't have much going on anymore. Mizuho locates the Riards, which means it's time to form a pact with Volt. Sheena is understandably terrified and refuses to form a pact, but Lloyd and Corinne manage to convince her to face her fears. As you travel through the Temple of Lightning, there's a real sense of impending danger. I already mentioned the music for these dungeons, but it's really thematically appropriate in this case. There's hope and courage, but deep unease at the same time. Precisely what Sheena must be feeling. The puzzle here is kind of interesting, but the major sections of the temple are separated by these dark rooms you have to traverse repeatedly. I feel like I'm gonna have a seizure. There's no block moving, but there's plenty of block destroying. Confronting Volt, Sheena's worst fears are realized as he goes berserk once again, killing Corinne and injuring the party. There's a lot of energy going into this fight. You really want to see Sheena overcome this hurdle, and having her best friend die puts a lot of emotional emphasis on the occasion. For the sake of everyone that risked their lives to protect me, Volt, I demand your power! A 
I've never felt so much animosity towards a sphere in my life. As for a cube, well, that's a different story. Volt is successfully defeated. Because the summoned spirit of water, Undini, is considered Volt's opposing force, the pact formed between both spirits severs a mana link between the two of them. Even the spirits themselves aren't sure of the implications, but they're certain severing all mana flows would cause Silveront and Tetheala to drift apart from each other. With that in mind, the party resolves to form a pact with all summoned spirits in both worlds. In order to reach Silveront, we'll need the Riards back. They're located in a renegade base in the north, and I can't fucking get the boat through here. The Renegade base features another puzzle involving block moving. You have to run around fighting every enemy until you find a party with a chief in it, signified by the headdress. That's about as literal an interpretation of chief as you can get. How about a badge or something? Once you beat a chief, you'll get one of three phrases needed for a password. It's nothing overly complicated, but as mentioned, I appreciate that there's some emphasis on making locations unique. The design of the tech base is significantly different than the Temple of Lightning, for instance, and I have memories of solving puzzles in both dungeons. There are a few things I like less in JRPGs than visually generic dungeons with nothing to do aside from fighting enemies. A little planning, a simple brain teaser goes a long way to adding variety. At the end of the dungeon, you fight Yuin. You know shit's about to go down when someone pulls out the double blade. Yeah, it would probably be the most cumbersome, unnecessarily flashy and ineffective weapon if you tried using it in real life, but it's cool. And in Japan, cool is always mightier than conventional. You get Riards now. Yay, no more Fjord navigation. They look pretty silly when you fly them around. Everybody's really coordinated. It's the nutshack. It's the nutshack. But now you can start visiting islands or blocked off sections of the map, previously inaccessible, so that's pretty cool. First things first though, we've got to rescue Colette. She's being kept in a dragon's nest that took me about 30 goddamn hours to find. Just ask for directions. No, it's fine, I know where we're going. No, there's somebody right there, just ask- I know where we're going. Rodayo declares that Colette is useless to him anyway and decides to feed everyone to his pet dragons, which is, of course, a requirement for any self-respecting Saturday morning cartoon villain. The party is paralyzed in a pool of Fanta, but manages to be rescued by Persea through her strength of will alone. Now we can start going after each summon spirit. I won't bother going through each individual spirit's dungeon and boss battle, so suffice to say this is what the summon spirit of Earth, Gnome, looks like. Yeah. Now, we're told that he's responsible for gravity. This is common knowledge for Silverantians too, which raises the question, how do they know about Tetheala's summon spirits? They don't even know about Tetheala, other than an elite few, and there are occasionally references to certain things that only inhabitants of Tetheala would know about. It might be a minor gripe, and I think you could easily explain by saying some spirit seals have never been found, but nothing like that is ever said, and it's a minor irritation to me. The dungeon for the summon spirit of ice, Celsius, Tetheala measures temperature and kelvins confirmed has one of these puzzles you know where you pick a direction and can't stop until there's something in the way i hate these man i hate these more than words can say after dealing with celsius the party sees smoke coming from ozette and heading there reveals its destruction this is brutal why does every town we visit end up getting destroyed in ozette we find a passed out boy named mythos now i know what you're thinking hmm mythos is an ancient hero mythos holds pacts with summon spirits but let me assuage your worries Mythos is a perfectly common boy's name in Tefeala. It's like Jesus or Jesus, you know? Never mind the fact that this is a work of fiction and could use any number of names, so there's no reason to create such a coincidence. It's definitely a coincidence. He's a half-elf who lives on the outskirts of the village and tells us he saw angels of Crucius raise the village to the ground. He's deeply afraid of humans and can scarcely believe that Genus and Rain are traveling with such a group. Genus and Mythos make fast friends, and it kind of reminds you, oh yeah, Genus is like 10 years old. It's actually atrociously irresponsible to even have him on the journey. He should be at summer camp or something, learning how to start a fire, ah, whatever. Mythos is genuinely childlike in a lot of ways. Seeing his friendship grow with Genus is kind of adorable. What could possibly go wrong? Heading to Altessa's house, we find that he actually worked as a craftsman for Crucius at one time. He turned his back on the work and hid in Ozette. Rodile tracked him down and blackmailed him to create the Crucius Crystal used in the Persea experiment. Rodile was, in fact, planning a revolt against Crucius. Learning all of this made Yggdrasil angry, at which point he sent his judgment down on Ozette. Following Altessa into his house to a- What the fuck? Get out of here! 
we ask him to explain a bit about Crucius, which reveals some more information. The objective of Crucius is to revive Martell, at which point the Age of Half-Elves will supposedly begin. No humans allowed, otherwise the Age of Quarter-Elves, One-Eighth Elves, or God forbid, One-Sixteenth Elves, will begin instead. The Chosen is just someone whose mana signature matches Martell's and could theoretically be fused with her soul. I think of mana signatures like DNA, it's why the Church of Martell arranges marriages and directs certain lineages, to have more worthy Chosen. The reason Yggdrasil split the world in two is because the mana links between two worlds create a cradle for something called the Great Seed, which Altessa doesn't seem to know anything about. Genus, at this point, says a smart thing when he brings up the fact that the legend of Mythos is the same between two worlds. They both have written records, historical artifacts, and essentially the same legend. The hero Mythos and his three companions ended the Great War in the Holy Ground of Carlon. Rain hypothesizes that the ancient war was actually fought between Silverant and Tetheala. Despite the worlds being split by Yggdrasil, they both share the same Carlon, which is how the legend of Mythos came to be known in both worlds. Carlon is, in some sense, a portal between Silverant and Tetheala, despite the fact that nobody really knows what it is or how to get there. Regal mentions a site near the resort city of Altamira referred superstitiously as the Otherworldly Gate. Nobody knows much about it, but people have gone and never come back, leading the group to believe this may be a portal. Ancient astronaut theorists believe the answers can be found by examining stories other strange creatures said to inhabit the island. Creatures like the Adaro. The Adaro are frightening looking creatures. They were said to have come from the sun by way of rainbows. They could be dangerous. They could shoot a poisonous flying fish at you. Meanwhile, Rodile has betrayed the Cardinals and begun construction of a massive project called the Mana Cannon. Rather than being driven by an ideal like Crucius is, Rodile just lusts for power and wants to overtake Crucius. Staying overnight, we find that Rain has left. Tabitha saw Riard heading for the town of Altamira, so that's where we're headed. Altamira is basically controlled by a massive corporation called the Lazareno Company but most people don't seem to mind all that much. A chief in the company mistakes Persea for someone named Alicia, coincidentally the name of Persea's younger sister. She was apparently killed in some kind of tragedy and investigating her grave reveals an embedded X-Sphere, which is holding on to Alicia's consciousness. She visits Persea as a ghost and doesn't manage to get much out, but we find out that her master Bryant killed her. If that's Persea's younger sister, that Crucius Crystal must have really stunted her growth. Well then, that makes it okay to no, we are directed to the Otherworldly Gate where we find Rain. I guess she just assumed that no one would follow her. Why? Why would you assume that? That's like a little kid's justification for running away. You're our healer for crying out loud. We'd have to pop a hundred apple gels a minute if it weren't for you. So Rain finds out that the Otherworldly Gate is where she and Genus were abandoned many years ago. Rain then describes in relatively great detail where she and Genus were raised, what happened to them, etc. The implication here is that her obsession with ruins and archaeology is a result of her trying to understand and find this place, which is kind of a cool twist on the classic, hey, look at me, I'm an academic who loves smart people things. But it's a little weird that she's never mentioned it, or that Genus wouldn't have been told anything about their upbringing. If Genus was a baby, Rain would still have been old enough to have remembered. I guess she's either been lying to Genus, or, well, he never asked. Also, Mythos dropping the greatest piece of expository dialogue in the history of conversation. We were born and raised in the village of the elves. The village of the elves? A secret village said to be off limits to anyone except elvenkind? Uh, no, a different one. The party is then confronted by Sheena's childhood friend, Kuchinawa. He's joined forces with the Pope in order to track the party down. The Catholic Church joining forces with the ninjas. This is a sight you never want to see. Apparently, he's still sore about his parents dying when Sheena failed to make a pact with Volt. Before Kuchinawa has a chance to exact his revenge, a full moon activates the otherworldly gate and the party is farted out near Palma Costa where they drop Mythos off to be babysat. By the way, all of these loose ends in the plot will later be sorted out with side quests. The party runs into Yuen, who again plays things up like he wants an alliance. We've gone from foes to friends to foes to slightly bigger foes, and now we're friends again. There's absolutely no reason to trust this guy, but with no other leads, Yuen is the party's best bet, I guess. Yuen explains that the Great Seed is the final seal, necessary to reunite the worlds. Would that 
that the Great Seed could germinate and become the Great Carlon Tree once again, there'd be more than enough mana for both worlds to flourish. The thing is, oh for fucking crying out loud, here we go again. The thing is that Daris Carlon, which is actually Crucius' base of operations, is itself a giant mass of mana. If that much mana were concentrated on the Great Seed, it'd grow to become the Great Carlon Tree, but Yggdrasil can't do that because all of that mana is being used to sustain Martell's soul for resurrection. Her Crucius Crystal is fused with the Great Seed. If Martell awakens, the Great Seed will disappear, and if the Great Seed germinates, then Martell will disappear, so it seems like a bit of a precarious situation. So, how do they keep her asleep? Angel Roofies. The purpose of Crucius is maintaining that delicate balance, while Ewan and the Renegades want the Great Seed to germinate at the cost of Martell's life. Okay, so they're the good guys. Why the fuck do you keep trying to kill us? We fight angels. We fight God. We're your best bet. Please stop trying to have us murdered. You know, I don't think the story's bad. It makes a lot of sense once you stop and make all these connections, but I can't help but feel there's some unnecessary misdirection going on. The game subverts your expectations twice an hour. It's making everybody hard to trust, which is fine depending on the tone of your game, but does kind of remove the shock of future plot twists or the excitement of a plot explanation when you're expecting one every 20 minutes. This isn't a 90 minute film noir, it's a 50 hour long RPG. The party decides to seize Rodile's mana cannon in order to stop him from dooming the world, and using it ourselves if necessary. Rodile's ranch is straight up structured like a Pokemon gym, why did he build it this way? In order to reach the control room, they'll have to pass a small variety of simple brain teasers and mildly annoying challenges. Oh, how delightfully devilish, Rodile. Reaching Rodile, he uses a Crucius Crystal on himself and becomes… oh my. Is this permanent? Cause it seems like the ones that turn people into angels are a lot more convenient, and not just because you can keep your opposable thumbs. I'm a little curious, given that Designs are half-elves hellbent on the resurrection of Martell, how did he convince so many Designs to work for him on the mana cannon? And wouldn't abandoning both Martell and the Great Seed cause the end of the world? Oh, minor concerns in the name of evil. We defeat Rodile and he sets off a trap which fills the room with seawater. Boda and two of his men arrive just in time to deactivate the self-destruct, but must sacrifice themselves in the process. Why did he need two of us? Why couldn't I just stay home? Just when things are looking grim for the party, Mythos arrives on a riard to save everyone. I'm so happy we're friends! Oh, well, that tears it. Mythos is evil. Prepare for the Mythos is evil revelation, everyone. With the Renegades as allies, we can use their dimensional transportation system. This means going back and forth between Silverant and Tetheala whenever we want. We've got to deal with the remaining summon spirits, which means returning to some of the earlier seals, meeting the world's only North Dakotan summon spirit. Okay then! and dealing with the Summon Spirit of Darkness. He was split into five pieces, so we have to collect them all and guide them back to the altar. Their pathfinding really leaves something to be desired. Come on, move it. Move your fucking ass. No, why are you? The world really opens up at this point, allowing you to pursue side activities or mini games that were previously inaccessible. I'll cover them all in one large section, but just know that you can pump the brakes on the main story here. It's a much needed bit of breathing room. Making a pact with the Summon Spirit of Light severs the final mana link, which causes the Great Seed to go completely out of control. The links acted as a cage to keep the seed in place, without which it's germinated and engulfed Martell. According to Ewan, we'll have to use the mana cannon. Apparently firing it at the tree will cut off its mana source and force it to stop growing. Also, Ewan has been manipulating Redial into building the mana cannon this whole time. What an unnecessary plot twist just to toss it in there. It really doesn't add anything to the story. The Azalea Human Ranch is still directing mana flow to the tree, which needs to be cut off. Lloyd volunteers, since that's where Shokala is being kept. Yeah, remember her? Remember when the story was about the Chosen One saving the world? I remember. Infiltrating the ranch, we save Shokola and confront Forcistus, another memory from the beginning of the game. It's kind of cool that we've come full circle here. It's been so long that you can easily forget that Forcistus is even a character. Back when we first saw him, we had no frame of reference, so it was easy to assume that he was the primary antagonist at that point, before getting embroiled in all this angelic craziness. So I like that some 30 hours later, we're finally back to deal with him. You learn through an optional skit that Forcistus is considered a selfless war hero among half Elves, once again hammering home this notion of moral relativity in Silverant's world. In a different world, maybe they could have been allies. <laughs> Sheena uses her summon spirits and the mana cannon successfully stops the Great Tree. 
The Great Seed is once again bound in the holy ground of Carlon. What the? For that, I owe you my gratitude. Thank you. When did we get this wacky gramophone? Who's been carrying this around? Oh yeah, Colette's sleeve rips, which reveals an affliction she's suffering from. Her skin is crystallizing, literally becoming a giant X-Sphere slowly. That's pretty terrifying. You ever heard of tripophobia? It's a fear of many small holes bunched together. It makes some people feel grossed out and itchy. Apparently it has something to do with our brains associating those images with parasitism or disease. That's kind of what this brings to mind. It's nice to see Lloyd treat Colette so well. She's obviously freaked out and worried that everyone will think it's disgusting. And they do. And it is. But one thing that's universally true about Lloyd's character is that he's not a surface level guy. It's the soul that's important to him. Can't say the same for everybody else though. Apparently the Tower of Salvation has disappeared from this world. Now the tower is a symbol of hope, and with it gone, people believe the Chosen's journey has failed. While the other Chosen's paid with their lives, Colette is still fine, which pisses everybody off. Yeah, well, I'd like to say this is silly, but I'm sure it probably would play out like this in real life. Gotta lay the blame somewhere. Kratos drops a hint about how we might cure Colette's disease, which means starting back at Altessa's place. Hey, if you're becoming a giant X-Fear, who better to talk to than the X-Fear expert himself? It turns out that the earthquake in Silveront happened in Tethayala too, and Mythos injured himself protecting Tabitha from falling boulders. You're a really nice guy, Mythos? Guys, I don't know how much clearer I can be here. Mythos is evil. So Colette's disease is chronic and Jealous Crystallis in officium. Can we dumb it down a shade? How about Honeycomb Arm or Soraya Swiss? You know, because there's holes in her arm. Altessa says if we can find records of others suffering from the affliction, he'll have a better idea of how to cure it. So we head to the library in a nearby town. There's a book which describes in great detail how one of Mythos' companions had the condition. Now that I'm thinking about it, they really blur the line between legend and reality with that whole Mythos backstory. In the beginning, the whole Mythos thing is stated like it's a myth from ages past. Then they start talking about how their historical artifacts proving how everything went down. Now we literally have books at the local fucking library describing in detail what Mythos' favorite cocktail is and how his sister dealt with her crystal skin. If the information is this readily accessible, you'd think it'd just be common knowledge. With further reading to be done and information located in Maltokyo Castle, it's back through the sewers. Here we encounter Varley doing some shady deals in the sewers and what amounts to the most awkward and unceremonious scene of vengeance I think I've ever seen. choreography, I don't know, is that what you'd call it? It's so weak and weird and stilted. It really just feels like they forgot they'd need to have Persea kill Varley. So with three dollars of budget left, they shoved this scene in between major plot points. The Kavar vengeance scene certainly wasn't perfect, but the way it unfolds with the camera angles and everything gives it a little bit more uh, dramatic oomph. This is just kind of sad. Breaking into Maltokyo Castle, we find the book, or rather, the book finds us. <laughs> We've got to find a collection of materials in order to heal Colette, starting with something called the Mana Leaf Herb, found in the elven village of Heimdall. The village of the elves? Secret village said to be off limits to anyone except elven kind? That's the one. Heading to Heimdall means traversing the Emir forest. The puzzle here falls somewhere between annoying and kind of entertaining. Some elven kid is blocking the way, asking you to find a fruit in the forest that'll supposedly heal his sick mother. Don't make me angry, kid. Don't make me angry about elves. The sorcerer's ring directs animals in the forest to perform certain tasks, starting with knocking a fruit into the water. It's pretty hilarious, going to these cockamamie lengths to get the fruit, making pigs charge at rocks, getting a ride across the forest from birds, but it's equal parts frustrating too. There's so many little things that can go wrong, and if you screw anything up, back you go all the way to the beginning to find the fruit again. Thankfully, there's some butterflies that give you a general idea of where to go, but most of this puzzle needs to be figured out yourself. I will say as puzzles go in this game, this one requires the most active involvement from the player. It's not just a teleportation maze or a block pushing test of patience, but a huge variety of tasks you need to perform to get the fruit, which in turn makes it hugely satisfying when you finally do grab it and get access to Heimdall. Unfortunately, like everyone else in the world, Heimdallians aren't too keen on half-elves. Whatever happened here, it's resulted in the mere mention of half-elves and the hero mythos becoming taboo subjects. I do like the atmosphere here, it reminds me of Ozette, there's just this quiet sadness surrounding the village. Whatever happened here clearly isn't over in their minds, they're distrustful and insular people. The village elder reluctantly informs the group where they can find 
find the Mana Leaf Herb, Lathion Gorge, located deep in the mountains. He grants you access, and it's time for another navigational puzzle. This time you become a bubble and hitch a ride on these air-shooting plants. Whee! I like the idea. Some plants are dead, some are alive. Feeding plants various types of fruit will either rejuvenate them or kill them, both of which are occasionally necessary to either promote or interrupt an airflow. Unfortunately, there's only a couple times where you actually need to use the fruit, so what could have been a really solid puzzle ultimately isn't much more than a fun idea. After retrieving the herb, we find a storyteller living alone in the mountains. We're informed that Mythos, the hero that is, not the completely unrelated child living with Altessa, was born in Heimdall, but but was cast out when the war began. His motivation for ending the war was quelling the discord between the different races. Even though they were treated with disdain, Mythos and his companions still moved forward with their ideals. The reason he's considered taboo in Heimdall is because he became a fallen hero. Mythos and Yggdrasil are actually the same person, Martel was his sister, Kratos and Ewan were his trusted companions, with Ewan being Martel's fiance, and their offspring are none other than the entirety of the cat's race. The cats have been lurking in the shadows, pretending to be simple, nap-loving photographers and businessmen, waiting for their chance to reclaim the land of Deris Karlon, where their terrible reign will begin. The Tower of Salvation? Yeah, it's actually a giant scratching post, a symbol of cat supremacy that appears only when a Chosen is born. It's the Chosen's job to rub behind their sacred ears, since their paws are too chunky to do it themselves. Yggdrasil is just a front. The real man behind the scenes is Adolf Catler. Okay, I'm, I'm Sorry, I got a little carried away with that one. Anyway, Mythos and his companions came into ownership of something called the Eternal Sword, a symbol of power given by Origin, the leader of the Summon Spirits. Only with this sword was Mythos able to split the world in two. So let's mark that on our to-do list. Need Eternal Sword for later. With a Mana Leaf Herb in our possession, there's a few other things we'll need to cure Colette. The first is a Mana Fragment, which can only be found in the Crucius homeland of Daris Carlon. The entrance to Daris Carlon is in the Tower of Salvation, which can only only be accessed by the Crucius Crystal of Tethyal is chosen. Zelos decided to leave his crystal with his sister, Celez, for some reason, so we have to head off and get it back. Seems like a minor detail to include here, but it's all worth noting because it expands Zelos' backstory a fair amount. Celez and Zelos don't have a great relationship, but it begins to make sense when you learn their history. Zelos' father was the previous chosen of Tethyala. He took a half-elf mistress, who had a daughter, which is Celez. His father ended up killing himself, presumably because his secret was discovered and Zelos inherited the title of Chosen. Celez's mother then tried to assassinate Zelos in order for Celez to become the next Chosen, but botched the assassination and killed Zelos' mother instead. Celez's mother was executed and Celez was locked into this room, either on house arrest or because of poor health. The game and all the extended universe stuff is a little ambiguous about that. Either way, damn. Everybody ends up parentless in the end, it's probably why Zelos ends up developing a detached front. He treats both women and seemingly his own teammates as objects to be used to achieve a different end. Anytime the conversation approaches something deep or meaningful, it's like he remembers the part he's supposed to play and reverts to his usual smartass self. Speaking of character development, let's talk about Regal for a minute here too. Regal hears Persea talk about Alicia and wants to know more about their relationship. The reason Regal wanted to talk to Persea back when they first met is because of an obvious family resemblance. Regal became confused when Persea mentioned she has a younger sister because Persea Persea is visibly quite young, though with the stunted growth of the Crucius Crystal, she's much older. The person who killed Alicia is actually Regal, who is the president of the Lazareno Company. Boy, that's really something. Imagine if Jeff Bezos ran up to you wearing handcuffs with his midriff exposed and started asking questions about the little girl traveling with you. Wait a minute, why is a little girl traveling with you? Alicia worked for Regal back before the handcuff thing. Well, maybe there was a handcuff thing going on here too, uh, I don't judge. Alicia was experimented on the same way Persea was, but things went horribly wrong in Alicia's case. When things didn't work out, her ex fear was forcibly removed and she became a monster, who Regal was forced to kill. Initially refusing to hurt her, he ultimately did kill her, and resolved to never use his hands to harm another person again. I mean, don't get me wrong, I respect the symbolic gesture, and I understand that everybody deals with grief differently, but to take that statement so literally that you start running around and killing people with your feet instead is a little beyond the pale. It's a ridiculous 
notion that despite the part he's playing in literally saving the world, he refuses to fight with his hands. But it's very anime. It's all I can say. It's like the coolness factor of a guy walking around in cuffs doing crazy spin kicks and shit outweighs how stupid it is. Like I mentioned, coolness outweighs practicality every time. There's a parallel here between Lloyd's father and Regal, given they were both forced into the exact same situation. But Lloyd's dad is walking around without handcuffs. I mean, he wouldn't be walking around without handcuffs, would he? Because he's not alive anymore. Or is he? If Alicia's X-Fear isn't destroyed post-haste, her consciousness will continue to exist in the void for eternity, which would be rather unpleasant. So they say their goodbyes and she's laid to rest. With all of these different character arcs either ongoing or concluded, you can see how much effort Symphonia puts into its main cast. Their designs are fantastic and each one plays differently in combat, but there's a real focus played not only on giving them unique personalities, but backstories that appropriately frame those personalities. The creepy quiet girl may not exactly be a one-of-a-kind trope, but in Perseus' case it makes perfect sense. She's been robbed of her humanity for decades, her time has been stolen from her and she's lost basically everything. For her to never smile, not show affection for others, and stay completely withdrawn makes sense. Regal's solemn expression is perfectly fitting for a man who has literally, physically shackled himself to accountability, and the courteous, formal manner of speaking starts adding up when you realize he runs the most powerful company in the world, if only in name at this point. <laughs> Those are just examples. I find it very easy to get invested in these characters and want to soak up all the side content I can to resolve or expand their arcs. With the Crucius Crystal in hand, we head to the Tower of Salvation. After doing battle with Kratos, the party is rounded up by the Angels of Crucius, which look characteristically creepy by the way. There's a lot of great designs which would have benefited from a less cartoony art style. Even the sequel on Wii, as beloved as that game is, strikes a better balance between cartoon and realism. Of course, this is just a matter of opinion. I I just find the style in which characters are portrayed somewhat stifles the designs, which as you can see with the concept art are a more realistic representation of the characters. Anyway, the angels throw the group in prison located in the angelic city of Welgaia. It's somewhat unclear where Welgaia is, the entrance is in the Tower of Salvation, but I don't think it's considered a part of Daris Karlon. The function of Welgaia is basically the operational command center of Crucius. The inhabitants are angels, but it's not unheard of for designs to be walking around here too. The design is interesting, you can see how Crucius architecture influences the construction of the human ranches. A lot of JRPGs have tech bases or angels, but not many combine them in such a unique way. Before finding an escape route, we kinda guard into giving us the item we need for Colette, and you can learn a little optional history about the world. Apparently, Daris Carlon is a comet made entirely of mana, propped into the planet's orbit by the Eternal Sword. The Eternal Sword, as I mentioned, is basically a physical manifestation of Origin's power allowing the wielder to control time and space. I feel like with power over time and space, a less charitable individual could spend a few hours or days picking apart Yggdrasil's choice and how he uses the sword. But hey, maybe there's just some limitations we're not aware of. In any case, the sword is basically the sole source of Crucius' power, and without it, they'd lose Daris Carlon, the Great Seed, Martel, and basically everything would fall apart. During our escape, we have to do another one of these shit-ass puzzles. The whole justification is that the room has no gravity, but if that's true, why am I still anchored to the floor? Between that and the fact that this area is another giant maze, two of my favorite puzzle types are here. At least there's no block pushing puzzles. At the exit in the Tower of Salvation, we find the Eternal Sword. You have not the right. You don't have the right. Oh, you don't have the right. And by the way, you don't even have the right! Without an origin pact, he doesn't have the right to touch it. Sexy Disco Yggdrasil shows up to explain himself as the world's most insecure villain is wont to do. I am not changing the subject. Even if the giant tree were to be revived, another war would make it wither and die. He justifies his limiting the mana between worlds as a peacekeeping operation. See, if everyone had access to all the mana they wanted, Magi technology would increase at an untenable rate and result in war. I feel like this is actually a reasonably accurate explanation for a megalomaniac like Yggdrasil to come up with, trying to pull the plug on progress because it'll probably result in further conflict. Yeah, what's the result of that? People abusing their power? Starving underclasses? Death? Suffering? Like, right now, you mean? Yeah, I 
can see why you'd want to avoid that. That would be bad. With a little prodding, he reveals a more truthful explanation for what he's hoping to accomplish. What he explains as eliminating discrimination. By evolving their bodies through the use of X-Spheres or Crucius Crystals, the words human or elf will cease to have meaning. Removing the differences between races, and more accurately, emotion in general, conflict will cease to be a concern. It's interesting to see Genus so compelled by this goal, but it makes a lot of sense. He's been exposed to hatred from all races in both worlds. When this is the case, it's only a matter of time before young, impressionable people look for extreme solutions to their suffering. Pronima shows up to attack Genus, and Yggdrasil saves him. That kind of reminds me of something Mythos would do. It's similar to that, just a little synchronicity I noticed. New activity in regards to that certain matter Understood. Uh, wait, why are Not you leaving? Always. Is there a way to save everyone? Remember that. Sorry, everybody in the party is still alive, Lloyd, so... The path oh. you seek is nothing but an illusion. Okay. Bye. With Colette's disease progressing at a rapid pace, she's brought to Altessa's house where treatment begins. Spending the night there, the big plot thing happens. Ewan arrives, having knocked everyone out, maybe with angel roofies, to introduce Lloyd to his father. I don't get it. I only see Kratos. Where's Lloyd's father? <gasps> oh my god. Lloyd doesn't have a father. Yeah, so Kratos is Lloyd's father. There are definitely some hints that this might be the case. Kratos is seen visiting Lloyd's mother's grave in the beginning of the game, which of course would have been his wife. He provides some otherwise inappropriate guidance for Lloyd in the party throughout the game, giving Lloyd tips and telling him to become stronger. He recognizes Noish and spends some time with him. He also really went to town on Kvar, as if he was exacting his own vengeance. Which he was. Nonetheless, it's a cool twist if not a little on the cliched side. Kratos' approach to fatherhood may be a bit unorthodox, but all the pillars of dadness are there, down to this embarrassing disco outfit he's been keeping in the attic since 1976. Mythos arrives and starts it's wreaking havoc. <laughs> Stop it! What are you? Oh yeah, I guess this is a good time to tell you. Mythos is actually Yggdrasil. I know you thought this was a spoiler-free review. This was just such a shock. An upset. A revelation. I had to tell you about it. Although it becomes increasingly obvious, they do a decent job obfuscating the fact that Mythos is pure evil. There's a legitimate feeling of innocence you get from this kid when he's talking to Genus, and in some ways he's mentally still the same boy he was 4,000 years ago. Maybe they could have named him Saw Tim or something for a little misdirection. Alucard style. The number of plot twists or revelations per second in this game is pretty high, even for JRPG standards. Back when I first played the game, I absolutely absolutely loved that about it, but in my old age, I must admit, the breakneck pace gets to be a bit much for me. You're almost obligated to go off and do some side quests in between plot beats. But wait, the side quests are full of crazy twists too. It's also revealed that Tabitha was originally built by Altessa as a vessel for Martel's soul, but it didn't work out. It was the resemblance that caused Mythos to reflexively save her life. Lloyd, stop! Please, you're both my friends! No, Genus, actually, that's not your friend anymore. That's a psychopathic angel that causes a holocaust every 100 years in order to facilitate an interdimensional cockfight between two unassuming children that will have to kill themselves to serve his ultimate goal of making sure you can never feel happiness again. Not your friend, bud. Ewan explains that Yggdrasil's ushering in the Age of Half-Elves is a demented interpretation of Martel's wish, a world free of discrimination. Mythos let his previous previous hate-filled experiences of becoming a pariah twist that noble goal into something horrific, and I rank that motivation fairly high on the villain tier scale. He's been so committed to what he sees as a crusade for such a long time that he can no longer see his own actions objectively. If you let the ends justify the means once, you can do it a thousand more times, which is a similar moral conundrum to the use of x -Fears. With the Eternal Sword essentially the team's last hope, they'll need Kratos to release the seal. Doing so will expel all the mana 
and his body, likely killing him. Unlike the other summon spirits, Origen doesn't require a summoner to make a pact. Rather, he simply acknowledges one as his pact holder. In this case, Kratos and hopefully Lloyd later on. There's a famous scene that takes place in the snowy city of Flanoir. Hold it, as is a long-running tradition, I've got to rate this snowy city. Snow gently falling, very comfy. Warm colored lights gently illuminating the snowy streets, highly comfy. Everybody wearing middies and booties, most comfy indeed. Smoke billowing from chimneys, classic comfy. Ice sculptures of the Wonder Chef, Pac-Man, and... Bigfoot? Neither comfy nor uncomfy, but charming. Flanoir is, in many ways, the quintessential snowy town. There are a few minor flourishes it lacks, as it's extremely difficult to hit the coveted 10 out of 10 rating, but it's a very solid 9. Uh, right, so the famous scene. The party stays overnight in Flanoir, and while at the hotel, characters will knock on Lloyd's door to visit him. If you don't answer the first knock, a different character will knock for three visitors in all. The party members who visit you are entirely dependent on your relationship levels with them. I mentioned early in the review, you can influence different affection levels between Lloyd and the different teammates, depending on what skits you trigger, who you take sides with in arguments, and which side quests you accomplish, you'll gain more points with that character. As a young man, I went out of my way to court Sheena, not because I particularly cared for her personality, but because she had giant anime boobies, and that made me feel funny. But now that I've grown up and become a more cultured man, I've come to understand that Colette is, in fact, the obvious choice for Lloyd. Now, your relationship with the knockers, or I'm sorry, the people who knock. Who is it? Come on in can be purely platonic, as is the case for Genus or Zelos. There's obviously a bit more of a romantic implication for Colette or Sheena, whose attraction to Lloyd is occasionally hinted at, but regardless of who you pick, it'll change some aspects of the story later. With Zelos assuring us he has a method of wielding the Eternal Sword, the party raids Crucius headquarters the next day. Entering the Tower of Salvation, Zelos betrays the party and forfeits Colette to Pronima. This is genuinely unexpected. Aside from a few hints or odd moments, it's a bit of a gut punch to have lovable Zelos sell us out like this, but apparently his disdain for being the Chosen is strong enough that he's willing to betray everyone. He plays it up really well too, becoming a pompous dickhead just like Mythos did when he betrayed us. You hate being the Chosen so much that you would betray your friends? Oh yeah, I do. It's because of that title that my life has been a total joke. I really like Zelos voice actor here. He sells the scene and in general does a great job of confidently speaking some of Zelos' more embarrassing dialogue. Why thank you, my sweet voluptuous honey. What happens next depends entirely on your actions in the story. Remember when I told you that three different visitors show up in Flanoir? I lied. There's a fourth. You can stick around and wait for Kratos to come. If you do that, the course of the story will change and you'll fight Zelos here. It's interesting to me that this scene is almost hidden. The conversation that occurs between Kratos and Lloyd in Flanoir does a lot to flesh out their relationship and deals with any remaining bad blood that may have existed between them. Meanwhile, fighting and killing Zelos in the Tower of Salvation is kind of tragic. Despite his obnoxious attitude, Zelos is a likable character. He injects some humor and absurdity into the dialogue when it's warranted, and like many of our characters, he's had a tragic past. To see our class clown lying here talking about how he didn't really want to live anymore. Why did you fight us? Because my life was a mistake. It hits hard, man. Personally, I think the path in which Zelos lives is the more appropriate one. He'll ultimately come back in a scene befitting his character, and for story purposes, it's good for Lloyd and Kratos to have unresolved static. The party has already committed to fighting Kratos in order to release Origin's seal, so given Kratos' whole protective-from-a-distance approach to being Lloyd's father, I doubt he'd choose now of all times to start getting emotionally involved with his son. Kratos believes it's too late to have a meaningful relationship with Lloyd, Lloyd respects Kratos' willingness to protect him from the shadows. It all has to culminate in a fight where their thoughts and feelings can be expressed without words, but not yet. So after Zelos betrays the party, Colette is kidnapped once again. At this point, you have to navigate through the tower while your party members, one by one, sacrifice themselves so that Lloyd can continue on. Each one of them wholeheartedly believes in him and understands he's the only one who can possibly match Mythos' will. The scenes in which your party members sacrifice themselves are pretty well done. 
they showcase each character and how they deal with fear of imminent death. They're probably starting to appreciate the courage Colette needed to spend the whole first part of the game, just waiting to be sacrificed for the greater good. My issue here is that some of the scenes don't make any goddamn sense. Like here, Lloyd and Genus are about to be trapped in a magic wall. They attack the wall to create an opening, which Lloyd runs through and Genus just doesn't. Even if he's not fast enough, they can just attack it again from either side. The presentation is so awkward. Or here, a door is closing. Persea props it open with her axe, then she's grabbed by vines. Lloyd could just cut the vines, at least try, but he spends about five minutes explaining to her how he'll never forget her and then runs away. Again, you just have to use your imagination to justify why Lloyd would react so stupidly in these situations. It's immersion killing and has me yearning for another timeline in which the performances are mo-capped or something. Also, Genus was still in my party when Rain chose to sacrifice herself, so where is he? Why isn't he screaming in terror, begging her to come with them? Why isn't Rain telling her brother that she loves him? Am I crazy for thinking this is a huge misstep? Lloyd reaches Yggdrasil and so does the entire party, as, depending on your choice, either Zelos or Kratos will have saved them. You probably saw this coming from a mile away. It's a rare occasion a JRPG is bold enough to kill off even one main character, never mind the entire cast. I'm here for the power of friendship conquering evil, not fucking depression. Colette emerges from this Crucius MRI machine, which I guess is supposed to transfer Martel's consciousness to a new body, and Martel in Colette's body actually recognizes Mythos. Mythos, what have you done? For the first time in 4,000 years, his preposterous plan has actually worked out. Only Mythos has become somewhat unrecognizable after four millennia of overtly evil scheming, and Martel isn't very impressed. In fact, she's downright disgusted. Mythos becomes completely manic and broken. Martel? Even you reject me? No. Martel would never say something like that. <laughs> You almost feel a bit bad for the guy. He then, for the second time, gravely misinterprets her final wish. She really needs to stop making final wishes, it always seems to end up causing problems. So Mythos leaves Colette's body behind and returns to Daris Carlon with Martel's consciousness. And it's time for us to head back to Heimdall and start getting amped up for the fight of the century. In this corner, a 4,000 year old warrior who's hacked his own biology to literally become an angel. He's strong, he's fast, he's He's got the moves and the experience, it's Kratos. In this corner, a 17 year old kid named Lloyd. And fight! Oh shit. That's embarrassing. After Lloyd wins the showdown against Kratos, he agrees to release the Origin Seal. It's a fantastic scene between a father and son. I love this line in particular. I've defeated Kratos the Angel, the one who betrayed us. And I forgive Kratos, the hero of the ancient war, who helped us. That's all. It's absolutely emblematic of Lloyd's take on things. Mistakes can be undone, transgressions can be forgiven. In moving forward, we can find redemption, but sometimes we just need to duke it out first. A lot of times in media where someone is immortal or lived for 4,000 years, there's this assumption that they've got a wealth of knowledge and experience and just inherently understand life better than everybody else. But I don't think that would necessarily be the case. People become stuck in their ways, cynical, especially when they've seen so much horror in their lives. Lives. To live for a long time would be to lose a part of your humanity and forget the ideals that once drove you. Accruing knowledge and having experiences don't amount to anything if you lack the wisdom or self-reflection to apply them. And in Tales of Symphonia, it takes Lloyd's influence to remind Kratos of that. Sometimes you fight for so long, you end up fighting for the sake of it and forget what it is you're even fighting for in the first place. Combine that with a sunk cost fallacy of about 4,000 years of labor and Kratos really needed to be shook out of his cold stupor by this dumbass teenager, fighting for the same things he and his companions once fought for. And that's what makes the father-son relationship beautiful, isn't it? For everything you can teach your kid, you get a nugget of wisdom in return. You may have already known it somewhere inside that big old, unfoundedly confident head of yours, but you do need the occasional reminder. Kratos releases the seal, but manages to survive. Origin comes forth expressing his lost faith. Boy, when the closest thing to God himself here lacks faith, the 
the world is in pretty rough shape. Moved by Lloyd and now Kratos' optimism, Origen agrees to form a pact after battling the party. Unfortunately, just as the pact is made, Mythos shows up, or rather his consciousness does. After their battle in the Tower of Salvation, Genus picked up Mythos' Crucius crystal as a memento of who he used to be as a friend, at which point Mythos' soul shows up and possesses Colette. He'll actually possess whichever party member you're closest with, but regardless of who he chooses, he snatches them up and takes them to Daris Carlon. First of all, Genus being a dipshit, I can hardly believe it. Second of all, I'm not really clear on why he stole Colette's body, or how his consciousness can simultaneously exist in his own body and a Crucius crystal. Or did he just disappear into the crystal here? Why? I thought a body needed to match a mana signature in order to be possessed, which is why the whole chosen system works the way it does. How can Mythos just possess any old party member? I got questions, man, and nobody here is answering them. Anyway, Colette's body is taken to Daris Carlon, and the Tower of Salvation starts collapsing. Mythos plans on taking Daris Carlon as well as the Great Seed and getting the hell out of here, the result of which will cause both Silverant and Tethiala to wither and die. In order to wield the Eternal Sword and reach Daris Carlon, Lloyd needs to use the Ring of the Pact, which Kratos just so happens to have, except it's broken. As with all our weird, specialized jewelry needs, we take it to the nearest dwarf, which is Lloyd's second dad, Dirk. Wow, look at this boy's house. Boy's house. Did you hear that? Yeah. Boy's house. What is that? What is this kind of sounds like my voice. Boy's house. He's boy's like boy's house. house. It sounds like boy's he's saying house. boy's house. Boy's house. Boy's house. Living in a boy's house, baby. Oh boy, just three boys. Boy's house. We're quite decking at the boy's house, baby. Just three boys living in a house. Sorry about that. Kratos gives Lloyd his sword, and Dirk reveals a sword he's been working on for a while. Great job on the color coordination, dads. Imagine if Dirk was crafting a bright green sword this entire time. That would be a fashion faux pas worthy of a mass extinction event. Together, the swords are called the Material Blades, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't think they were super badass when I played this game as a kid. And now. Now I know what you're thinking. Hurry it up, Magilar. We've got to get to Daris Carline and save Colette. Now, hold your horses. Before we go one step further, I want to talk about the side quests. There are so many of them. Side quests, optional activities, mini games, they absolutely packed this game with missable content. Between that and all of the branching paths you can choose, there's a lot more replayability in Tales of Symphonia than the majority of games in this genre. There's also titles you can unlock for characters, either by completing optional activities or progressing the main story. Titles give you a stat boost and a particular direction. Or in rare cases, change your character's costume. I'm gonna cruise through some of these side activities so you can get an idea of what I mean. There are mini games like uh, Red Light Green Light, Simon Says, and of course, Desert fucking uncle. Desert Uncle is the most absurd thing I've ever committed to in a JRPG, and that feat will not be easily topped henceforth. There's a specific window of time where you can head back to the desert and encounter a middle-aged man. He's put a group of men together for a game that he calls Desert Uncle. After very, very nervously agreeing, what you find is a mini-game where uncles walk towards the screen. They stand in a police-style lineup afterwards where you have to identify each one in the order that they pass the finish line. It starts out manageable, but becomes really, really hard, really fast. I mean, look at all these uncles. To keep track of them is madness, and you're rewarded with 2,000 gal, sorry, 1,980 gal. That is nothing. However, if you complete it, you'll unlock a harder difficulty mode. If you beat this harder difficulty mode, you get nothing. But if you do it like five times, you'll unlock a title for Lloyd called Midlife Crisis. It is utterly useless. It offers no benefits, no costumes, 
and takes like three hours to unlock. And you bet your ass, I slapped that title on Lloyd and wore it proudly until the bitter end. Till I got one that dresses Lloyd like a pirate. I mean, how are you gonna top that? If you switch your character to Colette, you can name dogs in every town. I guess that's cute. My girlfriend got pretty mad when I told her that I haven't found every dog yet. My work is never done, it seems. As previously mentioned, Lewin is a wreck and donating money slowly brings the city back to life. It's pretty satisfying to see the nameplate for the city slowly change over time, from City of Devastation to City of Rebirth and finally City of Water. If you spend the exorbitant sum required to bring it back to its former glory, you're awarded with a weapons shop that sells some uh, interesting gear. These are actually some of the best weapons in the game. Remember Governor General Dor with the freaky wife? You can actually find and heal her in a rather unfinished looking cutscene. I wasn't expecting a huge production, but it feels tacked on and kind of an unsatisfying resolution, especially after the party made such a big deal out of this whole debacle. You can visit the hot springs and watch a comedic scene as Lloyd is caught accidentally peeking at the girls bathing. Colette gets a title called Ironing Board. Wow, what the fuck? That's terrible. Sheena gets a title called Wow, because big boob make monkey brain go wow. It's so absurd. Similarly in Altamira, you can win a day at the beach. You're allowed to pick who will accompany you, and of course, the choice is obvious. I'm having a lot of fun. There's an amusement park in Altamira too, and you can pick someone to join you on the teacups. And of course, the choice is obvious. It's the most fun you can possibly have. There's this whole floating city in the sky called Exire. As far as I know, coming here is entirely optional, but there is quite a bit to do. First of all, Rain and Genus come to find out that their mother lives here. She's completely lost her mind, treating a stuffed doll like a baby and calling it Rain. It's interesting to see their reactions to this. Rain in particular has an uncharacteristic meltdown. Why are you raising your voice like that? You'll wake Rain! I'm Rain! I'm the daughter you shunned and abandoned, not that doll! Genus is here too! What are you talking about? There must be something wrong with you. You're the one that's wrong! How could you... How could you... Genus' only memories are of being in Isalia, while Rain remembers fragments of Tethiala and carries the trauma of being abandoned. Reading their mother's diary reveals that abandoning them was out of necessity. Because Rain was hyper-intelligent, the family were pursued by the Imperial Research Laboratory, who keep half-elves in servitude to the state. Rather than being forced to give up Rain and probably Genus to an unscrupulous group of scientists, she sent them through the otherworldly gate, figuring it would probably result in a better life than what she could offer them. Despite the fact that she She's lost her mind, Rain and Genus promise to visit her again. And this not only offers some solid insight into Rain's personality, but it's a nice bit of closure for their arc, which has up till now kind of been up in the air. I will say there's a much stronger focus on Rain than Genus here, which I get. They have basically the same background, only Genus is younger and less experienced, so there's less to do with him. Every single person in the party has some kind of tragic backstory except for Genus. They try to make up for his lack of real arc by having him be personally betrayed by Mythos Revelation. But but he remains the less interesting character out of all of them, if you ask me. There's one more thing you can do in Exire. If you have all the other summon spirits under your belt, you can find a secret path behind a house and find a hidden summon spirit, Maxwell, who's supposed to represent the four elements. He's represented as a goofy old man. His energy is what keeps Exire afloat. You can defeat him and get his summon spirit to be used in battle, but I don't really use Sheena, so you might get more mileage out of him than I did. You can fight in the Colosseum, attend a dinner party to get formal clothes, for everyone, find Corinne's spirit reincarnated and give Sheena some closure, get Regal a sick ass chef outfit, get Genus a sick ass cat's outfit, get Prisea a sick ass Klonoa outfit, waste 14 hours gambling in the casino until you finally hit it big and spend 150,000 chips on an outfit for rain that isn't even close to worth it, and then there's the Sword Dancer. The Sword Dancer shows up periodically through the story, offering up a pretty tough challenge each time. If you manage to find and defeat him three times, you get Lloyd's best weapon. Wow, Showing up the material blades already, huh? This is like your dad giving you the Les Paul he's had for 35 years as a Christmas gift and then him finding it collecting dust under your bed. There's another side quest worth mentioning called the Devil's Arms. During the story, you're approached by a demon hunter named Abyssin. I guess it's his mission to fight the Abyss, which, if you stare at long enough, will call the police on you for the third time this month, Barb. The third fucking time. The police have real crimes to solve. It's not your sidewalk. I can look wherever I want. You can just get some curtains if it bothers you so damn. 
damn much. A Bishon asks you to collect a set of weapons called the Devil's Arms. They appear pretty weak, but apparently gathering them together is a necessary step in stopping an evil mage called Nebelim. Some of the Devil's Arms are pretty easy to find, others require you to jump through hoops to hunt down. If you bring them back to the Temple of Darkness, a Bishon uses their power to become an incarnation of Nebelim himself, resulting in one of the toughest fights in the game. I was playing on normal, but this was a little taste of what Mania difficulty must be like. The quick thinking and strategy you have to employ far outweighs anything I experienced in the game thus far. I can imagine it's quite a different experience on higher difficulties, but I'm not sure that would necessarily make the combat better, at least for my tastes. Animations are still stiff, there are too many roadblocks that interrupt your momentum, and having to pause to go into the menu to grab healing items every few seconds does get old very fast. Nonetheless, Abyssin is a great fight that really put my characters to the test. You can also return to the village of Mizuho as Shina and duel Kuchinawa to settle things. This fight always whooped my ass back in the day, but I think I was a sufficiently high level this time that it didn't give me too much trouble. Shina is just a bit clunky to play as after Lloyd, and outside of summoning her, techs don't really offer much by way of utility. It seems that's often the case in Symphonia that the game will introduce an arc or problem with its characters before letting you actively choose whether or not you want to resolve it. As I mentioned before, I appreciate the boldness of the developers, allowing you to choose whether or not you want to pursue such a huge swath of content, and it does feel more rewarding to finish up a story knowing that you weren't required to do so. The last side quest worth mentioning is something so obscure and out of the way, but so substantial I've spent every waking moment trying to understand why they hid it so much. There's an optional dungeon called Niflheim in the game, something I never knew about when I was younger, and likely never would have figured out. At the very ass end of the game, instead of heading through the doors to the final confrontation, you have to solve one last block puzzle. Doing that and talking to a few people in Heimdall will ultimately lead you to a library we've been to during the main story. There's a cursed book here that'll pull you into Niflheim. It's randomly generated with each floor offering a different challenge. You've got to complete each floor before time runs out before facing off against a boss. This first boss, I'm convinced, is impossible on a first playthrough. I'd have to go all the way back here on a new game plus file with my stats upgraded because the floor was effectively wiped down with my ass cheeks. There's apparently like five more bosses or something, each one harder than the last. I can't even imagine how miserable it must be to reach that final fight, only to be beaten and sent back to the beginning of the dungeon. It's not particularly fun, but it's interesting to me that they invested all this time and programming into making a procedurally generated dungeon with unique challenges, only to gate it behind all of these prerequisites. It takes a lot of trust in your player's intelligence to include something like that, and I fully intended to shatter that trust by looking at a walkthrough find out how to get that steam achievement attached to this place. There you go, a cavalcade of side activities. There's a whole game's worth of extras for you to uncover. It's one of the reasons I enjoyed this game so much back in the day. There's always more to discover if you revisit areas you've already been. Unlocking a new costume is like the holy grail in Symphonia. You'll never find them all if you don't get out there and start hunting. Back to the main story. We head to Daris Carlon, which is disappointingly simplistic in its design. It's described as the elven homeworld, a city built on top of a comment, but what it amounts to is a bunch of narrow stone walkways that mostly just lead to dead ends. I was expecting something more in the vein of Welgaia, which you actually do enter on your way to confront Mythos. In Welgaia, each character has to face a psychological challenge, created by Mythos in order to have the party give up, or in some cases, turn against each other. As each character recalls lessons they've learned from Lloyd, they overcome their fears and anxieties, and Mythos becomes increasingly desperate, as if to say, why won't anybody give in to their hate like I did. It's because you're a little wiener, Mythos, and nobody loves you. You little bastard. Your sister rejected you, her fiance thinks you're creepy, and Kratos is smoking a cigar and sipping cognac on Dirk's patio right now while they swap embarrassing Lloyd baby stories. Did you know he called his underwear panties until he was almost seven years old? Lloyd once ran buck naked through the Tethiala royal family's dining room. Colette is rescued and we infiltrate Mythos Castle, which is a little more like what I was expecting from Daris Carlon. It's kind of cool to walk around entering all the different rooms. There's libraries and dining
mining areas. It's dungeon-esque, sure, but it actually seems like a place where a tyrant like Mythos would decide to live. Before confronting Mythos, we get the classic, every party member pipes up to talk about what this means to them scene. You gotta love it. Mythos has reverted to an almost childlike view of the world at this point, outright ignoring and disparaging all of the perfectly logical objections the party has to his increasingly genocide-y worldview. You fight Angel Mythos here, and it's a pretty good fight. Not nearly as ball-busting as Abyssian, but a solid challenge. As an aside, I find it cool how everyone with the Crucius Crystal has different looking angel wings. If the mana signature is supposed to be like DNA in this world, maybe angel wings are like fingerprints. Everybody's are unique. Now what would a final boss battle be without a second fa- oh, what the fuck is this? Where did you get this? How are you squeezing in there? Does the compartment fill with LCL before it can be used? Now this second phase is embarrassingly easy. He has next to no ability to guard, so you just wail on him till he loses. And honestly, I'm all for that. Getting to serve Mythos a cosmic beatdown feels like a just reward after all the punishment he's put us through. Despite all of that, Lloyd decides to grant Mythos one final mercy by destroying his Crucius Crystal before his consciousness is trapped forever. With the Eternal Sword in hand, Lloyd tells Origin to restore the link between both worlds. However, it seems like the Great Seed has died, which means the land is doomed in spite of its relinking. Lloyd's x glows and he sprouts some really impressive angel wings. I guess that's the result of Project Angelus, which Lloyd's mother was forced into. Now, I know the angels of Crucius, so I say that size doesn't matter, but good goddamn, look at those things. He's the most angely angel yet. How can Mythos we little winglets compare? Lloyd and Colette fly to the Great Seed. Oh yeah, she can fly, remember? Why couldn't she just fly out and grab that fucking fruit? Why did I have to sacrifice so many pigs? They fly out to the Great Seed using the mana of Daris Carlon to revive the seed and thus Martell, who is intertwined with that seed. Martell shows Lloyd what'll become of the Great Carlon tree one day, but for now it's just a seedling. Ultimately, it'll supply enough mana to both Silverant and Tethiala, which are at last connected to each other. She asks him to name the tree and he calls it This tree's name nothing, since the game ends before he can give it a proper name. Talk about a cock block, but I figure it must be Yggdrasil, since that's actually the name of the world tree in Norse mythology. Although Great Carlon Tree is a perfectly serviceable name. How about Bobson Dugnut, or Sleeve McDykel? In the end, Sheena returns to the village with the ultimate fate of becoming village chief. Zelos? Well, I'm not really sure, but he's in good standing with the Tethiala royal family, so we can assume his aristocracy continues in some form. Persea joins with Rig who's reassumed control of the Lazareno company in order to destroy all x manufacturing facilities and revitalize the lands that are still suffering. I feel slightly robbed that Regal is still wearing cuffs. I feel like it would have been a solid ending for him to be donning his El Presidente suit and finally forgiving himself, but character models take a long time, I get it. Kratos decides to stay with Daris Carline with the justification of, if a half-elf of Crucius remains here, the other half-elves will have no place to live. I guess the implication is that Crucius is so universally hated that they really need to be wiped from the face of the earth in order to give the half-elves a chance to have a fresh start. The only problem is that Kratos isn't a half-elf, he's a human. We've established many times that he's a human, so this line doesn't actually make any sense. Nonetheless, it's a great send-off for Kratos and signifies their relationship as father and son, distant though it may be. Mom, Dad left. That was okay, wasn't it? For me to let him go? It was okay, right? Lloyd. You wanted to go with him, didn't you? Go with him? To Daris Carlon? What would you do? Just walk around? Looking for treasure chests as you float through space eternally? I don't know, maybe he's going to colonize another planet or something. Lloyd and Colette, as promised to each other, set off on a journey to find and dispose of every last x -fear. And that is a wrap. From here, you can use all the grade you've accumulated to purchase some new upgrades for New Game Plus. Stuff like double XP, retaining all of your titles, getting higher grade scores, all kinds of things. It'd certainly be worth replaying the game with some of these bonuses, blasting through the optional battles, and taking story paths that you didn't previously. That's it, that's all. My experience with Tales of Symphonia. Did it go as planned? I would say unequivocally, yes. Oftentimes, going back to games you cherished as a youngster can result in disappointment, but I felt no such thing here. Now, don't get me wrong, I notice weaknesses where I might not have once upon a time. The combat is perfectly serviceable, though not the game's strongest aspect at this point. Where the combat system is at a disadvantage is that future Tales games all iterated on the same system, making 
objective improvements in many ways. This highlights some of the clunkier aspects of Symphonia's battle system where it might not have been so noticeable once upon a time. In addition, the presentation does leave something to be desired. Despite some excellent character designs, a huge array of enemies, and some creative ideas for the environments, the cutscenes are a bit of a hindrance, constantly getting in the way of the story and turning some emotional gut punches into a bit of unintentional comedy. Symphonia does have a multitude of great qualities, but where it shines the brightest is in the character department. There's so much care that went into each of these party members, not just personalities, which all immediately stand out as unique, but their personal history, backstory, and the reasons that they are the way they are. It's hard enough to write charming dialogue, but to have each main character be sympathetic in their own way is something even the best RPGs often fail to accomplish. It all comes back to Lloyd, undoubtedly the glue that holds everything together. The story of this game is very good in its own right, with a few inconsistencies or weaknesses, but what really carries it is the dichotomy between the overwhelming complexity of the events that unfold and the single-minded focus with which Lloyd charges forward. Things are confusing, there are alliances being formed and betrayals shattering trust. Every 15 minutes we are introduced to a new villain and that bogs the party down in hesitation, in all cases except Lloyd. Lloyd doesn't think things through. That gets him into trouble, but it also means those overarching goals we've had since square one are ever present in his mind. He never doubts what's good or just, he moves forward primarily through intuition, which is what manifests his laughably impossible task, a stupid dream from an idealistic teenager, into reality. It makes him likable and charismatic. He reminds me of some traits that I occasionally lose to cynicism, but if there's one thing Lloyd teaches us, it's that positivity is a muscle that can be trained. It might become weak, so weak that you think you've lost it, but it's always there, waiting for you to seize on it and the ideas that inspired you in the first place. There are a lot of themes in Symphonia, what it means to practice the virtue of sacrifice. When is a sacrifice noble, worthwhile, and when is it just a wanton disregard for your own life? Speaking of life, there's another prevalent theme, every life being deemed equal. People living freely, without the fear that drives discrimination, or the fear born from being discriminated against. People aren't just what they look like or who their parents were, they're the culmination of their actions, and if your actions have been shitty, well, hey, people can change. If you can internalize that, then maybe a world free of discrimination isn't just some sociopathic angel man's pipe dream, but a real possibility for those who understand differences rather than use them as bludgeoning tools. In a world full of confusing alliances, politics, ideologies, this thing, conflicts, and disasters, it takes a real Lloyd-type person to stick to their principles and call a spade a spade. I may not have realized it back when I first played the game, but it's that simplicity filtered out from all the colorful anime craziness of Symphonia that really resonated with me, and playing it again after all of these years was like partying down with an old friend. He's the same guy I remember. He's over the top, he's got his problems, but he's got heart. I've spent a lot of time with him and I'm a little exhausted, but I know we'll be seeing each other again sometime in the future. Also, he's got an older brother that everybody hates, and I guess I'm morally obligated to go hang out with him too. Thanks so much for watching this video. When I started playing Symphonia, I had no idea this script would be this long, and it's turned out to be quite a monumental project compared to what I'm used to. I'd like to thank my patrons. Your continued support means the world to me. And in particular, I'd like to thank those in my Person of Lordly Caliber patron tier. Matthew Dick and Adams, uh, I'll go with Safranco, even though my Canadian prairie brain wants to say Safranco. Can't tell you how many times I had to do another vocal take because I said mana instead of mana. If you enjoyed the video and want to see more, please consider liking and subscribing. If you really liked it and want to see more, please consider becoming a patron. Every little bit helps. Don't underestimate how much kicking in even just a couple bucks makes a difference for me. Much as I enjoyed Symphonia, I'm happy to be done with it for a little while. Plenty of gas left in the tank though and lots of ideas for the future, so all I can say is, I hope you enjoyed the video, and until next time, stay healthy, wealthy, and wise.